Howdy, y'all. The name's Merle, and I'm here to tell y'all about something special that I discovered while sifting for gold the other day. Why, it's licensed to watch his Patreon page. What's that you say? Well, it's the most rootinest, tootinest, bonus content site this side of the Missouri. If you mosey on over to patreon.com slash L2W and subscribe for just one dang old dollar, you'll find all sorts of gold nuggets up in there. The Funny Boys over at License to Watch cover such classic films as Cliffhanger, Rudy, Twister, Hard Boiled, and all of them Star Trek Next Generation movies. And coming out next week, Dune, the David Lynch masterpiece from 1984. You can't forget that piece of crap. So come on and don't be a low-down lazy dog and pony up for some real good shit. That website again is www.patreon.com slash L2W. Head on over and pledge your dollar now, you cheap skates. Yeehaw! I'm getting the hell out of Dodge. Get up! Yeah! Often considered to be one of the worst films ever made, Exorcist II, The Heretic, was once cited in a review as a stupid and useless film whose mere existence is difficult to justify. From the original film, both writer William Peter Blatty and director William Friedkin wanted absolutely nothing to do with a sequel to The Exorcist. From the get-go, the attitude and effort put into the sequel were lackluster. The initial idea from the studio was to make a much cheaper film incorporating unused scenes and alternate takes from the original. However, when playwright William Goodhart was hired to write the script, he actually produced something that sparked some interest in English director John Borman, best known for the Academy Award-nominated thriller Deliverance. A small budget crushed Borman's dreams of shooting on location in Africa and the Vatican, limiting the production to shoot almost entirely on the Warner backlot. The shoot was plagued with setbacks including endless script rewrites, oversaturated film footage, which inevitably necessitated reshoots, and director John Borman coming down with a respiratory fungal infection called San Joaquin Valley Fever. This forced the production to stop for over a month, costing no. millions. As previously mentioned, the second Exorcist film was met with strong negative reviews from critics, many who saw its very existence as an affront to the first film. For years, it stood as the most cited example of a truly needless sequel, one that diminishes the power of the first film. Over 40 years later, criticism has softened a bit, and the film could be admired for some of the things it tried to accomplish. Whether or not it delivered the way audiences expected it to, you have to acknowledge the ambition of this film. Exorcist II tried to be something very radically different than the original. But in this particular case, I guess audiences just wanted to see some head spin again. So sit back and adorn your giant locust headdress, fire up your blinking light mind melding machine, and spontaneously burst into flames for no apparent reason, because we're jumping into the first of four Exorcist sequels. Join Harris McCabe, Colin Shaw, and me, Matt McGregor, as we try to make sense of the second Exorcist film, 1977's Exorcist II, The Heretic. This is a show about franchises, spooky film franchises. You're listening to License to Watch. Why in the world was this movie made? Jesus Christ! Welcome to the show. This is License to Watch, and I'm here. Uh, my name is Matt, and I'm here with Harris and Colin. What's up, guys? Hello. <laughs> yep, it's me. I always love your intros. <laughs> you, you, you got riveting stuff there. Wait, we got to be more high energy. Like, woo! I, I save my best stuff for my intro. Here he comes! Here he <laughs> I comes! Like a, I'm back! I rewrote that several <laughs> times. I was like... Hey guys, what's up? Or hello? Or hey, how's it going? And I ended up going with hello. I felt like <laughs> I feel like it's a strong choice. Sometimes the boldest choices strong, aren't the biggest. <laughs> yeah. Um. So we're today we're talking about the classic film Exorcist Two, The Heretic. Uh, joining us today to talk about this classic film is a friend of the pod and uh, writer. Is that your? Your yeah, moniker? writer director. Are you, you can you can, you can t- give me both. You know, I'll take take what I can get. Writer director. Yeah. This is uh, Mina Ramamurthy. Hey, how's it going? 
What's up? Hey. Welcome. First time. My timer. screen is fro frozen on Harris um, blowing his nose, so it's good. That's that is how I. That's how I want to be remembered. Actually, like at my <laughs> funeral, can we just have like a big, <laughs> the big picture of me blowing my nose next to the casket? <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh yeah um i i was thinking like a whole stone statue of you mid nose blow <laughs> the other option yeah. we have uh is also the snot rocket where you're actually holding down one nostril and <laughs> attempting to to shoot the mass of phlegm uh, That's, uh that could be like a fountain <laughs> that could be like a fountain outside my mausoleum <laughs> <laughs> um so anyway, so so Mina, um, we like to start the show by asking the guest um, what they're like, if if any, if there's like a personal connection to this movie what? or this series, or <laughs> if they're if you've seen it before or if this is your first time, just sort of give us a little background on your connection to The Exorcist and particularly The Exorcist Two. Um, I have almost no connection to this. Uh, franchise although I, I i do remember like i have not seen exorcist one but i remember that wow. i think my parents said that they saw it in india and that is my main connection hearing about other people who saw it um but i i i, I know that there is like they like to do like the famous scene is like the bed scene and stuff like that but um i just i try to stay away from horror movies um but here we are so I'm into it. Let's Great. do it. Great. Well, thank you for You picked a good for, you picked a good one because this is barely a horror movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's not scary that's, at all. That's yeah. literally one of my notes is that this is a sci fi movie, not a horror yeah, movie. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's one of the reasons it's one of the reasons I kinda liked it. <laughs> oh, that's that's the main reason I liked it. Like yeah. that's the thing about it I like is that it's a sci fi <laughs> movie and not a horror movie. Yeah. It comes at you. It starts in a very similar way with the main titles, like all in blood red and like scary, like chanting kind of eerie music. And so it sets you up in the same way that the first movie sets you up that like scary, eerie, like shit is going to happen right away. And I just like I, I, the whole time I was watching it, I was like, something's going to happen. It's going to jump out. She's going to turn into like the demon thing or whatever. And it the movie ended before like anything they really, really happened make you substance. wait for the scary and then you're like okay when is there going to be a demon pop out no, it, 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 when is james Earl jones going to show up when is tap dancing going to mean something there's just, <laughs> just a lot of yeah, questions for sure <laughs> well, when is the lullaby of broadway going to come into play at the end here <laughs> are they going to put on a show or um, the only way to stop the demon is to put on a show <laughs> yeah, they took a long time to get back to that tap dancing. And I remember that she was tap dancing the first time we saw her the whole time. And I was just thinking to myself, what the fuck does tap dancing have to do with anything? It was very hard to watch as a filmmaker. Like, uh, why did they plant this? There must be something there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of plants with no payoffs. There's a lot of payoffs with no plants. Yeah. yeah, or like Ned Beatty shows up, and I'm like, oh, this guy's like a known actor. Like, he's going to be important. Nope, he's in like one scene as an nope. airplane pilot or whatever. I'm, my theory on that is that Ned Beatty showed up because – so his wife plays the the psychiatrist's assistant, uh, Liz. Uh, and Liz. The redhead? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I think he was also in Deliverance, which is the director John Borman's probably most famous movie. Um, right. So I think he was probably friends with John Borman, and they were like, hey – you want to show up and like just do a quick cameo, and I'll cast your wife in a bigger part. And he was like, "Yeah, sure, why not?" Um, so I that, I assume that that was it. But there was so much like that that it's like, wait, why is this happening right now? I don't understand this at all. Even the character of Liz, I oftentimes was like, "Why the fuck is she even here?" Like wait, sorry, she's just standing Liz? in the background. Who is Liz? <laughs> the assistant to the psychiatrist. Oh, I thought her name was Sharon. No, Sharon. No, Sharon's no, that, the other she's one. She's another character who. Why oh. is she the other, the other? Yeah, the other assistant. Sharon is there because Ellen Burstyn wouldn't come back to play the mother. Yeah, so they, so they, they brought like, back the. So they the, brought back the mother's personal assistant. Nothing will make the mom come back. Like your daughter is possessed by a demon. I'm still out. Like I'm not coming back to this girl. Like man, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like she, she just keeps on taking jobs in foreign <laughs> countries, and we don't really know why. <laughs> This this movie accidentally makes a strong case for a couple things. Um, one is that that mother is uh, 
guilty of criminal neglect, <laughs> and the other is that, and the other is that a train can go faster than a plane under circum under certain circumstances. Yes, under ghoulish circumstances. That was, yeah. that was crazy. I was like, any mode of travel possible to get to the ghoul. But also, yeah. like, was he possessed then? He was, like, in and out of being possessed. Uh, it, it didn't There was sense. so much. I mean, we're jumping way ahead, and I think we should probably save save it and deal with it down the road. But I think this movie, there's so much to unpack here, and there's so, like, the plot goes in so many directions that I feel like we need to address the plot in a summary yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. who's doing it, Harris? Co- you're, no, you're doing Colin's it? Oh, in Colin. charge of these ones, isn't he? Oh, it's me now. Oh, great. I thought I, who did <laughs> I, who did the first one? Good luck. I who did the first did exercise? I thought you did I the did? first one, didn't you? I have no recollection of that whatsoever. I don't know. That's I because you were possessed. I could try <laughs> oh, it. Damn. I, no, I, I still want to do it. I still want to do it. Let me. Your uh, your memories of the summary are repressed, and we have to extract them via like <laughs> light, like a machine uh, that makes no sense How whatsoever. How are you going to make this coherent? I don't know. You know. Oh no! The, oh, don't worry about that. I'm I mean, try. They're never, they're never coherent. <laughs> Even if the movie makes sense, the summary never, never does. I'm trying to remember if I did the first one because I can't remember. We definitely decided that it was me or Colin were doing this one. Um, oh, you know what? It probably, it probably was me though because shouldn't, shouldn't I? I'm picking the next movie, so shouldn't Matt be doing the I, next one? For some reason, I thought it was Matt. It definitely wasn't me. Oh, it's whoever doesn't pick it. Yeah, I guess yeah. it was me then. Yeah, uh, it was probably really good actually. I'm I'm thinking about it now, and I'm thinking it's it was really great. At this point, we've talked about the summary of the movie longer than you, you're allowed to do it. So let's get those two minutes okay. on the clock. All right, all right, here we go. Ready? On your mark, get set, go. All right, so it starts out with a priest, and he's like trying to do an exorcism, and some woman lights herself on fire and gets burned alive, and he's like, I didn't do so good. And he goes, and he's uh, he goes to like his higher ups or the pope or whoever, and they're like. Yeah, you got to find out what happened to the priest from the last movie. And he's like, okay, whatever. So then we see Reagan from the last movie, and she's tap dancing for reasons unbeknownst to us. Then we see her at some sort of psychological institute that looks like maybe a spaceship and is not explained in any way. Uh, and so the priest goes there, and suddenly the psychiatrist who works there is like, let's work together. Um, but I'm reluctant about it or whatever. Here's a hypnosis machine that allows us to meld minds together and <laughs> also enter the mind of people we knew. Um, so they hook, they hook, they all hook each other up to the mind meld machine and they start getting in each other's minds and they get in the mind of the priest from the last one. Uh, and they do that and they find out that, um, the demon from the first one is named Pazuzu and, um... Reagan is like doing weird shit on a rooftop like with no bra and then they keep doing that and then he realizes that back in the day the the old priest the one the first priest from the first movie he used to be in Africa dealing with this other kid who was possessed who used to fight the locusts and that turns out to be James Earl Jones so eventually after um, a bunch of fucking hijinks and weird demon shit that isn't that scary at all in fact not scary at all happens and then he goes to find James Earl Jones and James Earl Jones is like there's a magical locust that makes all the locusts not mad and just makes them be regular grasshoppers and he realizes that's a metaphor for who Reagan is and then they go back to the original house where they battle the demon again and he's tempted to take the power of the demon within himself and then Reagan becomes a twin of herself that's really the demon but then good Reagan says tear the heart out of the demon and then locusts tear the house down and the, her caretaker gets burned alive because burning alive happens again, and uh, everybody, everything works out fine at the end. <laughs> Where are we at? <laughs> that poor taxi driver at the end. Yeah, they killed that guy. They they killed the caretaker. Yep. Yeah. They felt like they got to the end of the movie and they were like, "Shit, no one's died." Oh shit, we forgot <laughs> we to kill to, anybody. We forgot to kill a black guy. <laughs> yeah. Is this a movie? I don't know. Yeah, exactly. I mean, seriously, <laughs> yeah, we've got yeah. we've this got this is a horror movie from the seventies. <laughs> we've got three th- we've got three deaths. It's the um it's the guy who falls into the crevasse, also a person of color. I right. don't know what um what what nationality he is or whatever, but um and then the and then the and then the black taxi driver who who is like reluctant to drive these crazy ladies to this haunted apartment <laughs> and As turns he out should he, sh- he should have listened to his instincts. Good he call, got black his come taxi up driver. In. Yeah, seriously. He's like he's like, why do I feel like I'm the only minority in a horror movie right now? Maybe I shouldn't be driving these white ladies anywhere. 
yeah. <laughs> Always trust your gut on that it one, guys. Was... Are you yeah. sure there's not another taxi behind me? <laughs> yeah. You guys want? Yeah. Is there an Italian taxi driver somewhere? They don't. They, at least he's got a fighting chance, right? <laughs> he was only two days from retirement. I have a lot of questions about his death, how it happened. I have a lot of questions about how that black taxi driver's death happened, but we'll get to that, I think, in time. So. <laughs> yeah, let's yeah. save that yeah. for the end. Um. So yeah, like we kind of mentioned, this movie starts off with uh, a scene where Father Lamont is, or yeah. played by Richard Burton, is in. Uh, th- do they say where he is in the beginning? For that girl, like burning uh, somewhere the where scene? they speak Spanish, I think. Yeah, right? I don't think so, but I think it was somewhere in South America, wasn't it? It's always South America. They might have said, but it, it's somewhere they where they speak Spanish because um, in the very end, Reagan speaks Spanish to him yeah, or something. Yeah, I was like, bring him this around. Is not the callback that I expected of all the potential callbacks. Reagan saying "por qué" yeah. was not because it. that's the, "por qué." Yeah, that first scene is like less than a minute and the very beginning of the movie and that was two hours ago you know <laughs> but i do also feel like that was that was this kind is of, a long movie but yeah. that was the scene i think that haunted him and that was part of why he like was losing his faith because this is the whole thing when he gets assigned to investigate father Marin's exorcism he's reluctant to do it it's like his old friend the cardinal is asking him to to look into their mutual friend Father Marin's death, and he doesn't want to do it because he's like lost his faith or something, which I think yeah. relates back to that. I'm not making excuses. It was a weird callback. I'm just saying. That <laughs> oh yeah. In, in its in its defense, it actually sort of came from this idea that you know that this is what like he was sort of haunted by his failure at this exorcism. U- ultimately, I think we all understand what the story was, but I, that does not mean that they did a good job of telling us. <laughs> the journey yeah. was yeah. Yeah. many. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Flimsy at best. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, um, I had read that they wanted the priest, like, not even – remember in the first movie there was, like, you know, the two main priests who both died at the end, and then there was that other priest. Yeah, Father um, D- Dyer. Father Dyer, Dyer. Yeah. the guy who's a, the, the guy who's a real priest in real life, and who is obviously um, loves show actor. loves show tunes and and is not. <laughs> yeah. an he's like a very. They wanted actor. that character. They wanted that character to be the star of this movie, to be the Lamont character, or I guess they wanted the actor too, because yeah. when he wasn't available, they totally changed. I mean, it could have been the same character. That's probably why there's the, the the tap dancing in this movie because he was probably like they were probably like how can we <laughs> how can we get this guy to come on board with this movie? Well, he loves singing, so like let's give him a song and maybe a little tap dance number. He and Reagan can fight the demon through a tap dance number at the end that was the original <laughs> script and then when they got richard burton he was like I, i'm not tap dancing <laughs> didn't it seem like the other kid in the tap dancing scene was somehow an important character and we never yeah. see him again <laughs> they were flirting yeah. yeah i missed that kid i think i was just distracted by the set design and why we were tap dancing at all there was a lot of just shots of her feet also during the tap dancing just seeing the tap action actually happen well, I th- maybe that was like to because because it seemed like they had a hard time getting people on board with this movie. And I know she she only Linda Blair only came back on the condition that she didn't have to wear the demon makeup again. Um, Which why would you agree to that? Like that's all people are coming yeah, that, to see. Right? Movie. <laughs> like I don't know, but she's like I, yeah. I just need to look hot. This whole movie, that's it. Yeah, yeah, I want to look right. hot, and also I want to show off that I've been taking tap lessons. That's my, my two things that I insist on. Yeah, she's like, people need to know that I'm more than a horror actress. I have other skills. I get it. <laughs> exactly. The director's like, we need the people to see how this sound of tap dancing is produced. More <laughs> shots of her feet. Yeah. <laughs> what is the logic? Yeah. Like, what is it? Is it just like anyone that comes in contact with her can mind meld or be traumatized? Any ideas? I, I think that's... I think that's what we got to talk about next is just what, like, how bad the hypnosis machine really is. Like, in it, it, as in terms of a watching experience, it's just like one of the worst things I've ever seen in a movie. I'm pushing back. Su- I am pushing back super hard on this. Oh. I am. I am not. I will not. I think the. I think the machine thing works, and I. And here's the reason why. So, I will admit there's problems with it. There's lots of problems that we can get into. But I, th- I think it creates a, a distinctive sound and visual effect that I think looks good and sounds unique. And I think that's important for a, for a conceit like this, that if we're going to have this like hypnosis machine thing that's like this totally high concept sci-fi reality where people can actually see into other people's brains and everyone's going to act like it's no big deal at all. 
you sell it by having like some okay, obviously okay, I'm sorry, obviously I'm they, sorry. Didn't, they didn't production design the hell out of it they did, it's not like a sophisticated yeah, thing yeah but how from, in the hell are you talking about a stick with a light on it and a headband right now <laughs> because that's what you're talking about i think what i think they executed it very well the light is super bright and it and it's sort of i it, i'm like, sorry this this machine made the film unwatchable for me like i just <laughs> yes i ca- i can't watch it you know i I, I can't watch that much lighting. And that first time they went down into the hypnosis, it was so long. So the flashing light. And honestly, like being not a fan of horror movies, I was afraid it was going to work on me. So I looked away. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not. That was the this. problem. I think you missed it. I think you missed the, cause it is kind of like, it's like, I think they did that l- long on the first one on purpose to sort of like go through i mean it was too long but i mean going through that process and they, they're repeating like mantras of like bring your tone down to my tone and shit like that um which i just thought like if you're gonna have it was like a lo-fi sci-fi concept that i think you know i think worked if you don't have a lot of money for some special effects or something i think they pulled but off it something did not work <laughs> it was a very literal plot device of like how can we bring out the footage from the old movie and connect it to characters who didn't want to show oh, up you know this time and they and they came up with an elegant solution. <laughs> <laughs> they somehow got Max von Sydow to come back and reshoot see, new scenes for this movie. I was shocked by that. I saw him. I saw his name in the credits, and I was like, "They must have flashback scenes." And I saw the first scene, and I was like, "Oh, they must have had unused footage." And then I saw the shit they shot with the kid in Africa, and I was like, "Holy shit! They actually got him for this." <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he was looking good in those flashback scenes. Yeah, he looked so young. <laughs> and he looked like he was out there just battling that demon, just just winning. It's amazing how good you can look if they don't put old man makeup, like terrible old yeah. man makeup on you. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that old man makeup from the first movie looks good. I can't, I can't believe you could say anything positive about this hypnosis machine. <laughs> I've seen a lot of sci-fi movies and a lot of bad sci-fi movies. And, and you're talking about this is like, you know, a sci-fi concept thing. The, the thing you have to do when you have anything like that in a movie is explain where the science gives way to the pseudoscience gives way to the supernatural in some way. That is a mistake some that way. so many sci-fi movies fall into of thinking we need to know how this is like potentially real. I think that you can do that if you can do it in an interesting way. But I think it's best, like some of the best ones are the ones that just say, fuck it. No, you're just in this reality. Deal with it and just let everyone catch up. I think this movie doesn't really explain anything yeah. to the point where like I often found myself like, Wait, where are they going? I, I right don't now think we ever why? could catch up because the rules were never like the, the rules never became clear. You know. Yeah. Yes, that is that is the problem. <laughs> That's you don't need to explain the technology, but I need to know if I buy the technology. What are the rules? What are the rules? That's of the what demon? I'm talking what about. What are the rules of? Yeah, but I got but I bought the rules of the technology of the the hypnosis machine. The yeah, thing flashing you, lights, mind yeah, melt. Got the, it. Flashing lights, mind melt. You don't <laughs> no. need to know anything else. <laughs> what, what, like, like that was pretty clear. That wasn't confusing at all. What was confusing was all the shit about the demon and who the demon can possess and all that shit. Right. And like what the priest was trying to do and and what the stakes were and yeah, what their goals were the and how their, and how their plan went wrong. Running at the end of the third act, and I was like, "What are we running to? Reagan's right here. She seems fine." What I don't, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, what. Exactly. Why did they have to go back to the house? So what does the house have mm-hmm. anything to do with anything? Why and what did he and what did he learn in Africa that he thought was going to help Reagan when this he came back? This Africa thing drove me crazy. I was like, this journey. I don't like why. You know, this movie took place over the course of months, <laughs> yeah. possibly years. Yeah, and the mom was gone the whole time and never called. <laughs> yeah, and never called. The, yeah. This was like the first draft of the English Patient, and I was like, what are we doing? It's so long, um, and it makes. Yeah. It was a sprawling epic. (laughs) There were so many times they would just jump cut to a new scene. And and I would just say to myself, like, why are we here or where are we? (laughs) When are we? So many times, like at least five times. And yet and yet at at least one occasion, they have a scene that's like a transitional scene for no reason. I'm talking about when um, Father Lamont wants to wants to interview Reagan, and Reagan wants to go under the hypnosis machine with Father Lamont there. And the psychiatrist is like, "Oh, let's do this. To- let's do this tomorrow." <laughs> Cut away to Sharon and and, yes, uh, and them eating Ra- Reagan with the Yuri Geller spoon thing, and then cut immediately back to her going under at the hypnosis thing. I'm like, "Why didn't they just do that? Then? <laughs> like, why didn't they just do that immediately?" Yeah. I don't know what, what we learned. Fuck? We learned Reagan's a trickster. Like, I don't. What did we? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, even in the script, even the script leaves you asking that. He's like, we should do it right now. And she's like, I think we should do it tomorrow. <laughs> and they're like, shrug and then cut to something else <laughs> cut back to this yeah there was th- there was a really s- short scene in the beginning where there was like someone was talking to someone on the phone with a girl that seemed deaf was that just to give us color of the therapy center yes i think that's what that was <sighs> yeah but it was also confusing as hell like what the hell that place is the sliding doors the lights on the ceiling what the fuck is this place it was a giant room separated by like circular smaller like glass rooms where things sometimes sometimes there were cots sometimes there was activities of children going on like testing or what have you and they all had sophisticated automatic sliding doors and I thought to myself, this is where the finale of the movie is going to be. Yeah. There's going to be some sort of like demonry like happening. Because they were the using, they did or, in like the first glass. interview thing, they used the demon reflections and the windows and stuff. Yeah, there was a lot of, of mirror stuff, yeah. mirror reflection shit. Even that bird thing on the roof was like the, the shiniest apartment she lived bird in. The pigeons. <laughs> I was like, what the, where are we? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to come to the defense of all of this <laughs> in, in just... Just in the sense that they, I admit that they didn't use it to its greatest potential because that would have been a much better place for the finale of this movie for a much more clever finale or the apartment that they, because both those sets were dope. But I am going to say, like, if you've got like a fun, you know, sci fi movie concept, go ahead and have cool sets. I thought the sets looked awesome. I thought like all the sets look awesome. I thought that cinematography was great in this movie. Like the first shot, I was like, wow, this looks good. And it, and it never disappointed me. It continued to look good. I think the look of this movie is its best attribute, and it's like the a lot of the effects were cool. Some of them were were corny, but <laughs> yeah, like I thought yeah. all the Africa stuff was like all miniatures and whatever. Like all the like landscapes of it the rocky, cool. like mountainous, and great use of color, great great blocking I mean, the, the, and camera the work. The matte paintings and practical effects, yeah, the blocking, the foreground, background stuff was cool. I mean, it's I mean i I thought the I thought the Africa stuff was fucking corny, but I think. Um, you know, I think the matte paintings and stuff. I mean, you know, the, right. for, for the In 70s, terms of visual cool. style, this movie's really, really yeah. good. But when you fuck up everything <laughs> else, it's so hard to like... Well, I don't know. I'm know. giving it a lot of points for the visual style and also the premise of it I thought was good. I just think they didn't execute it well. Concept's yeah. amazing. I even thought the music sucked. You know, I think the, the, the music was trying to do that thing of like, yeah, 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 like yeah. scary, like chanting sort of music. Yeah. But I, I, it went the wrong way for me. I was like, this is fucking... I just kept lowering it. I'm like, this is annoying for me to listen to in my headphones oh my god my cat hated it so much <laughs> it's any omori who who did all like the good the bad and the ugly right. and all the you know spaghetti westerns one of the great the all-time thing. composers and like somehow they it splits time between like that wailing and then there's that weird like <laughs> like weird vocal thing yeah! and the women mm-hmm. wailing oh yeah, yeah yeah and and then and then the other the only other score that i remember is like the schmaltzy um, like nostalgic, uh, happy ending, dreamy score, which is he does that in all of his. It's like the worst part of his composing is when he does something nostalgic and dreamy, and that is really like ninety percent of the score of this movie, and the rest of it is kind of just like scary noise. Yeah, not good. Very disappointing. And and they did oh. and they didn't include the one iconic song from the first one that everyone knows as the Exorcist song. Yeah, there was so much from the first movie that they didn't include in it. Like usually nowadays, when you make a sequel, half the time it's just fan service of like, "Hey, remember this from the first movie?" You know, and like this movie had basically none of that. Do you guys know the trivia? Like, why why didn't the director return for two? Because nobody wanted to do it. He didn't like. He didn't think a sequel yeah. was a good yeah. idea. I don't. Now think. I think there's one thing that I I read about this that I think might explain some of that. Originally, it was pitched as like a cheap knockoff sequel, like cash in sequel. So what they were going to do is they had like hours of unused footage of the exorcism in the first movie. Mm. So the plan was to write a sequel that was really just a a separate priest coming and investigating the first exorcism, but it was mostly going to be flashbacks. From for unused footage from the first movie of like the spider crawl and all this other stuff that they didn't like they did there was a lot of stunts and effects and stuff that they cut out of the first one that they were going to include as like new footage so they were basically going to just remake the first movie using footage from the first yeah. movie and just supplanting it with some other right. like fill in material and shoot it for like three million or something but they ended up spending fourteen but then when they brought John Borman on he was he like, was like oh, fuck I... that we're gonna do a real movie and I think the screenwriter yeah. the, they hired a playwright who I think went a little overboard, and they were like, fuck it, let's just do it. 
So I love that story of the production because it's like, oh, we'll just make a movie for as cheap as possible. And by the time the director is signed on, he's like, I want to shoot on location in Ethiopia and the Vatican. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, like, and the compromise was, okay, our $3 million turned into a $14 million movie, but at least we didn't have to go to the fucking Vatican. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, it's also interesting how like they made all these compromises for it and it still turned out kind of mediocre but i applaud the ambition of it like because i know we can trash it for not being scary or whatever but i mean the best sequel that i can think of is aliens and that wasn't a horror that was a sequel to a horror movie that wasn't a horror movie also you know so it's like i've got nothing against a movie sequel being like we're going to take it in a totally different direction and reinvent this and it can work you just have to kind of nail it and they didn't here for many reasons that we're discussing yeah, I applaud them, too, for, like, trying to broaden the mythology. Right. You know, they took the demon from the first one. They gave him a name. They gave him, like, a sort of an origin and the whole locust thing. Call me, was by, call me cool. by my name, my demon name. You know, that was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my dream name. My dream name. name. I was like, this yeah. is Inception plus yeah. call me by your name. I'm into it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Inception. Oh my god, that's a great example of like a really low budget device and they set it up perfectly where they explain to you what's happening. Like, isn't it just a cord that they connect I, to I themselves? would like to argue that Inception was not a very low budget um, <laughs> anything. That was a pretty the high device, budget everything. The device. Um, mean. Yeah. I mean the device, like the little cord they plug themselves into or whatever. Yeah, like they don't explain the science right. behind it. You just believe it because of how they explain but it to you. They explain enough of it to where it's not like I... To where it's not the whole time you're watching the movie, you're just praying that they don't bust out the little light on the stick again. <laughs> you're just mad because the headset looked a little chintzy. I don't, I don't think the light, the light on the stick visually worked. I, I, like what, You don't have to get fancy with this shit. No, it did not. Also, they're wearing headsets, but nothing's... What's monitoring? Like, what, like you're wearing the headset for something to monitor your levels of your brain waves or something, but... There was none of that. It was just a stick with lights on it and then headbands. And it was it was really unclear as to whether or not the head thing was actually hooked up to anything That's what I mean. at all. What was it hooked up to? <laughs> because they don't even need it by the end, really. The light they, they just they just connect to each other already, right? And even in the middle they're right. connecting. Yeah. But like e- even the like stupidest people who know absolutely nothing about hypnotism know that it's not shining a light directly in someone's eye and saying, okay, you're relaxed as, now. As a stupid person who knows, who apparently knows stuff about hypnotism, Colin, explain <laughs> to me what hypnotism is. <laughs> and uh, like, I don't, I don't feel like there's like, this is a very, very soft science. And in fact, I don't think it is a science. So like, I, I don't think that they have to follow the rules of hypnotism because I'm pretty sure those don't exist. You know, like the suggestibility thing is just like, I mean, they did get the repetition and the, there's always some visual f- focal point or something in hypnotic suggestion pretty much everyone knows that you have to be calm and enter a trance-like state and pretty much everyone knows that shining a light in your eyes is in makes you anxious it's it's a very it's a, i'm watching i'm watching it right now it's very rhythmic and calming it's soothing me despite your stupid arguments i am still maintaining my calm because i'm watching the scene where they're oh, they're the flashing scene. the light okay. right now as i'm seeing it yeah no, no I'm he's just, just staring, just at, staring a light. at a light this is, this is um, how you go to sleep every night <laughs> I yeah I it's how it calms me I just have a light <laughs> blaring directly into my iris. Um, I mean yeah like blinking lights they can establish a pattern and that could it's not you a know, strobe light for any listeners who haven't seen this it's like a very gradually undulating light beaming on. They the literally thing. call it a strobe light in the movie. <laughs> She's like look at the strobe light. She literally. I, says I watched it that. twice. I don't remember them using the word strobe. I think that would be unlikely since it doesn't actually strobe. It, it go, go gradually back. pulsates. She says it. She says literally, look I, at the strobe light. I wish you live fact check you now, Colin, but I'm bringing this up in our next episode. If 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 she if she doesn't say strobe, I'm calling you on it. If she does say strobe, I am never, ever going to mention this again. I'm calling Jake <laughs> Tapper right so, now. I have a question about this psychiatrist. She believes in the power of mind melding, but she won't make the leap in saying there's a demon in Reagan and it takes... Mm-hmm. Like that, that's mind melding is real science, okay. demons are not. <laughs> I love when he's trying to, when he's got the picture of him on fire and he's trying to find the fire, and she's like so skeptical. She's like, Come on, what she's she's predicting the future now, she's psychic. I mean, it's not like you know, 
we have magic mind control things in this reality. I totally even, forgot know? about the pictures. Oh my god, they didn't use that much that either. Yeah. Yeah, seriously, she's psychic. It's like now it's like the dead zone meets brainstorm and I'm like, what, what how many sci-fi elements are you going to include in this movie? <laughs> even I got exhausted by that. But I do love the dead zone and brainstorm. What I don't get is the timeline of things. Like this is supposed to be 4 years after the events of the first movie, I think. And she's just now like going to these psychiatry sessions and I don't know, like why? Like she knows what happened to her or like everyone else around her knows, you know, it, it just, what I think didn't make what sense she's to trying me. to unpack she, the traumatic incident. Is that, is but that she didn't seem is? very traumatized. She seems quite happy. They address it pretty directly at the beginning. She literally says to the shrink in the first scene we see her in, you know why I'm here. Right. And the shrink says, why do you think you're here? And she says, because my mother feels guilty. Oh, yeah, to you, make you know, my mom happy. Because of the traumatic shit that happened to her. But she says she's fine. But she, And she also tells everyone she doesn't remember, but she actually does, and all this other shit. But it's, I mean, they do address it. It's not like it totally goes unmentioned. What, what excites Reagan about, you know, she doesn't want to talk about it, but she's willing to go under hypnosis with the priest? Does she feel safe with priests? Yes. Like, what, what is Absolutely. that? Absolutely. How about that? How about that first? How about that first shot where she walks out of the office and sees the priest <laughs> and pauses and stares at him with his weird smile on her face for like eight <laughs> seconds? I couldn't believe how long that shot was. I was like, wasn't she leaving the building and then she goes back because the priest is there? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, the first when she first leaves the shrink's office, she you can see him in the reflection. You could see her, and they literally stare at each other wordlessly for like several seconds, and then she just walks away. And it's like, what the fuck was that? totally bizarre i took that as like she got a strange aura yeah. like a strange feeling from seeing a priest but but if you ever saw anybody no in your life and just stared at them and they stared at you for that long it would be weird so you, one of you would be like what what are you looking at asshole <laughs> like that's a strange thing to have happen <laughs> and neither one of them comment on it at all she's clearly really into priests I mean, everyone is in I these mean, movies. I mean, I was like, are they going to do the pre-sexuality thing? And, like, they, you know, it did get there. Yeah, I was it like, got there. But they, they, they took a long time to get there, so I commend them. I mean, the reality of these movies is that the underlying unstated principle of all exorcist movies is everyone wants to fuck priests. I think that's, like, the right. theme of the, ex- <laughs> the exorcist as a series is, man, priests are hot. Wouldn't it be great to fuck a bunch of priests? Um yeah, this one, it's a little bit more like, don't you wish we could be locusts and fuck each other and fuck yeah. priests? But I love the, um, I love the thing where he, where, I mean, what's the, we got to talk about, what is the psychiatrist, what is, uh, the psychiatrist lady's Jean. name? Nurse um, Ratchet. Jean, yes, Nurse Ratchet. Jean. Uh, Dr. Dr. Jean, Jean Tuscan. Tuscan. Yeah, it's, it's, it's Louise Fletcher, who was just coming off an Oscar for playing another psychiatric person. This was her Oscar-winning follow-up. How disappointing must that have been uh, for her and everybody? She, um, but you know, she—they're like, you can play a psychiatrist. You got yeah. it. Yeah, and she's and she um, is deciding that she's going to play this by like doing a voice that's—I don't even know what that voice. She's like trying to have like the calmest voice possible. She's still kind of Nurse Ratchet in this, the way she speaks. Yeah, were you guys expecting her to turn evil like the whole time? Because <laughs> yeah. I definitely was. She was so, I mean, I was like in her, because of her history of, of, of work as an actress, but she was so like, this. I was like, this therapist is showing up everywhere. She showed up to her tap recital. I was like, I don't know how to get a therapist yeah. <laughs> this good. She's I was committed. like, damn, yeah. she's And available. you know, that's not the only way she's available. <laughs> she was really throwing it out there when she was talking to Lamont. And she's like, oh, by the way, I'm divorced. And um, don't you feel like you ever need a woman? Like within seconds of each other. And I love his oh, response yeah. to that. He just looks at her deadpan and goes, <laughs> yes. And that's the end of the conversation. <laughs> yeah, like, yes. I'm just going to leave that there. And you could just take that as it's a no for you. But yeah. I, um, you know. Speaking of that, there are some really awkward, stupid, terrible conversations in this movie. Like most of the dialogue is just two people having separate monologues for the audience. But you know what? I, I, I think the performances, like they really believed it. I kind of felt like the performances were almost universally awful, except for Richard Burton, who was doing a convincing yes. job of, of acting sober. I don't know that I'm convinced that he's a priest or anything, but he definitely, <laughs> for a guy who was, I, who I think probably was drunk most of the time for his adult life, he was definitely, this is one of his most sober-seeming performances. 
and um and everyone else i thought was just <laughs> fucking terrible i mean L- linda blair god bless her she, like her delivery <laughs> is the same every time and it's just so earnest and uh, it, the facial ex- yeah well she's a child i you know i don't know what she's just like a little chubby child you know i don't know I like when Richard Burton yells at the bus driver. He's like, come on, this girl needs to get home. <laughs> oh, the bus driver? The bus driver eating the sandwich is my favorite performance in the whole <laughs> that movie. Sandwich the good. way he eats that sandwich, oh my God. Yeah. Oh my God. I dream of eating a sandwich like that. He took a nice bite out of <laughs> the it. The bus driver's reaction to him, to, to this random guy yelling at him to get on the road, is like, he doesn't like it, but he is legally obligated to do anything a cranky priest yells at him. That's like bus driver code or yeah, something. Yeah, I was like... <laughs> A real bus driver would eat their sandwich slower. <laughs> like, I don't like know according that. to bus driver code, I've got to do anything an angry priest yells at me. But I'm glad that that is not for everyone because <laughs> it rarely happens. But he wasn't in priest garb then, right? He was on his like vacation shirt. No, his, no, like, he African was in. Inspired. I think that was the priest version of the. Va- he went to Africa and he bought like a hip, <laughs> a hip, ar- uh, the red starry shirt, a hip yeah. Arsenio Hall shirt to, to wear under his, and that was like his uh, all his his thing. All right, so we're kind of talking about the cast. We're talking about Richard Burton and Louise Fletcher and Linda Blair. Um, let's talk about some of their better scenes. Like, what did you guys think of the uh, scene with Linda Blair on the rooftop when she's dreaming? Yep, it's great. Do you remember? But again, it was a scene where it was like, where the fuck are we? Why are we here um, for yeah, most of the scene? exactly. But it looked cool. I did like that. Oh, yeah, totally cool. Yeah. I feel like that's um, like whoever built that apartment should get a lot of points and whoever safety inspected that apartment should be deducted an equal amount of points. Like definitely. Well, yeah. I mean, I read that, I read that she, he just put her in the edge and there was nothing. To really? I was her. wondering. I, yeah. There, there were no, real she, and it wasn't even a stunt woman. It was really her. I was wondering how they did that. Cause I was like, this looks really dangerous. Wait, so her <laughs> flashback was to Africa at that moment or to, to Richard Burton in Africa. Is that what was her going flashback was remember. to young, the flashbacks, uh, Young, what's his name? Young uh, James Earl Jones fighting locusts in Africa. Okay. Mm-hmm. Which I guess is how Got she it. learned okay. how to fight off locusts with the Arsenio whoop whoop. Uh, yeah, I was about fist, to say also references bump. Arsenio. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna, oh there's my a lo- God. This is a heavily, heavily Arsenio Hall it. influenced movie, but that is how she beats a locust at the end by doing the Arsenio Hall whoop whoop with her fists, which she must have learned through that James Earl Jones flashback. It's insinuated that in that flashback when he uses the actual device like and he's spinning it around, it's making noise, that that doesn't work. That doesn't get rid of the demon. But when she does it at the end with no device, like just literally just whooping like Arsenio Hall, like you said, that works. What? So what is it that James Earl Jones does that gets rid of it? Is it is it just him being the guy? What, did okay, I so it? one of the one of the like subplots or themes that they're trying to convey with this story is that um, the the first priest, the older one, he believed that there would be people mm. who had um, mm-hmm. psychic or supernatural powers to fight demons. And those people would actually right. inherit, they're like the next species, they're like the mutants in X-Men. They're like the next evolution of the species, basically. Right. And we'll that's how we're going to just... Yeah, and that's how we're going to defeat evil. And and right, so he, right. they both were, both Linda Blair and James Earl Jones were both those kind of people. Um, but again, like, that's a really cool concept. And the, the movie did tell that story, but it did a really terrible job of telling that story. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't know what the action was that he did that made his goodness rub off Right, on and world. it's and it, it, it was, I guess, the story, the, the James Earl Jones version of the story, which is actually the plot of a later exorcist, prequel um is that uh father Marin, these uh the other priest from the other movie saved him as a young man when he was fighting off locusts which he had a special power over but then he becomes possessed by a demon because i guess it's a demon's job to find these special people and like corrupt them or kill them or whatever the demon is in the locusts okay right but he's also he possesses Mm. the boy and linda blair because he's trying to make them not effective as like saviors of humanity yeah it's like there's always successes and failures right. it's like sometimes the demon does so it's a little up bit to the better. priests yeah. to save them yeah, exactly. right can we talk about the locust cam oh yeah the oh it's really it, bad it's like the evil dead the evil dead cam <laughs> i thought all the other locust stuff looked pretty good except for those close-up yeah, shots I was yeah like, the natural you... locust stuff looked awesome 
some of that is real footage of like right. actual like plagues of locusts and mm-hmm. and the end they actually shipped 2500 locusts to like destroy that set and they were dying at a rate of like a hundred a day oh and they God. shipped them from another country or something like that yeah and in the credits That's they had crazy. they wow. credited they credited some like wildlife photographers for shooting right. all the locust stuff separately i thought you were going to say they credited each and every locust. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> they should have locust rights baby the runtime of the credits are the length of the movie <laughs> They all have like funny <laughs> pet names like slimy, crunchy, <laughs> like no, they gave up on those after the after the first like three hundred they gave up on the names and then it's just locust like th- two through a thousand. Um, you could do like uh, famous violin players, you know, like because they rub their wings together, you know. You could do that, mm. uh, much like the Ninja Turtles. Does Peta care about locusts? Did Peta exist no? back? Peta then? came out of I think Days of Heaven, not Days of Heaven. Uh, Peta came out of. Uh, what was the one that was a disaster that the uh, Michael Cimino directed? Um, oh, Heaven's Gate. Heaven's Gate, yeah. Uh, I think PETA, the whole PETA brand on it came out, out of Heaven's Gate where they killed a bunch of horses. Um, and I I can't remember Ooh, what year. Oh, yeah. wait, no. I think it's uh, it's another big famous bomb. I don't think it's that movie. It's like uh, I- Ishtar. Is that the one? No, it's I, I don't think it's Ishtar because that's a much later movie. That's the one where they're in the desert and, and there's yeah. like horses and stuff. Um, they might have killed horses in that movie, but I think it's I think it's Heaven's Gate was the one where they killed some horses and and that was the which reason. is that came out after this movie, right? Uh, so that's 1974. When was this one? Oh, this is later. This is 76 or 7. Oh, 77. Yeah. So, but that's entirely possible that, that it wasn't as big a deal by now. Cause if they, you know, might've taken some time to found it and, um, uh, oh, actually, yeah. wait, when, when was the movie made? I don't know. Yeah. I thought, I thought Heaven's Gate was like 78. Yeah. Oh, it's actually 1980. So there you go. Oh, so right. se- 74 was oh, when wow. they founded okay. the cult Heaven's Gate. So th- thank you, thank you, Google, for the comprehensive uh, look at everything mm. there. Um, That's great. Yeah, I watched yeah. Heaven's Gate recently. It's it's really not good. It's not very good at all. Um, uh, better than this? No, definitely no. not. Yeah, it takes itself too seriously. At least this is like this is like kind of fun and bad. Like the complaints on this so far have been that it doesn't make any fucking sense. Um, yeah, and but it but it's like. It's a high concept and it looks cool, you know. Yeah, and so that's kind of good enough for me in a lot of ways. For its oh yeah, for critics sure. at the time considered this movie to be an insult to the first movie, and this is this was considered one of the worst yeah. movies ever made. Which looking at it now, I I wouldn't call it one of the worst movies ever made. No. It's like you know a pretty well made movie for movie's sake, but it's like not a story told well. Yeah, so it's. Right. It's not cohesive. There's so many elements that yes. could be good. But it's like an interesting failure, which I think makes it better than like, I, I don't think it makes it eligible yeah. for being like the worst anything ever made. And I think that's, I think critics at the time were probably both overrating the first one a little bit because I don't think the first one has aged as well. I think it's, it's you know, still a good movie, but I don't think it's aged as well. And this definitely isn't as bad as I'm sure it seemed. Expectations were probably sky high, so. I think the first movie just instantly fell into the zeitgeist as like the scariest movie ever and like, you know, Mm. widely received as great. And so that'd be like if today someone was like, I'm going to make, you know, I'm going to remake The Godfather. Like everyone would just be up in arms. Mm -hmm. Like you can't you can't do that. It's, a you know, an insult to it. Well, which is a testament to like how The Godfather Two was considered better than the first one, which is pretty impressive when the first one was already considered one of the like like yeah. every once in a while a movie comes along and just automatically gets inducted into the Hall of Fame immediately, and it's like sometimes we look back on that and go, "Ooh, really? I don't know," you know. So this is one like I think it, Mina's already mentioned one of them. When's the last time anybody said anything about the English Patient? And yet that was for a couple of years. People <laughs> were like, "This is like the high water mark of filmmaking." And now everyone's kind of like, that? absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I don't know, not not great. Yeah. So you know, it's almost like we've been waiting a long time for someone to say something about the English patient. <laughs> oh my god. Oh Pazuzu. Pazuzu sounds like a pasta dish, actually. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah. So. Mm, <laughs> I love the Pazuzu. Pazuzu. Would you like penne or uh, Pazuzu? Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna go with the Kokuma. <laughs> yeah, Kokomo. Kokomo. I'm trying to be s- decide between the Kokuma and the Pazuzu. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent choice. They they go to Africa and like they're climbing boulders because that's where they have their 
seances or that's where they do their prayers on, on that's the, a there's a temple up there that's where their temple. temple is yeah and then somebody fell off that was like just like possessed again it, all they needed was like a line of setup to be like this is you know whatever in africa their temple is on top of a mountain and in order to get up there we have to climb you know like suddenly they just cut to people in a yeah. crevasse and you're like what the fuck is this? And then a guy falls down. Yes. yes. This is yeah. one of those things where, like Colin said last time, it was like a payoff. It was like a payoff and then plant. Because yeah. they, they, they did say exactly that in the scene in the Natural History Museum, where they're like, oh, here's this these people that worship at this temple that can only be reached through climbing up rocks or whatever. And it's like, that's that's all in the Natural History Museum scene, which is after we've already seen this whole scene yeah. with these people and then he travels there then we kind of know what's going on but at the same time it's like it's all backwards but we kind of don't confusing yeah yeah um why does it matter that we find that guy who died what, what what is the point so this is what happened as i understand it having watched it twice and become less confused about it the second time so he when he puts reagan under the second time where he goes into reagan's head and he sees Africa, and he sees Father Marin save uh, Kakuma's life by dragging him up Kokuma. this cliff. And as they're going up the cliff, Pazuzu decides that he doesn't want them to save Kakuma, so he sends a windstorm, which is why Father Marin almost falls. And Father Marin is like literally stepping on the head of this other monk, who all the guys in the turbans are apparently like monks that worship at this temple. And he's like, mm-hmm. and this monk is trying to help Father Marin, but he, the monk loses his balance and falls. And Father Marin watches him bounce off the cliff in weird, like he's moving very slowly, but it's not in slow motion. It's like it's some of the shittier effects oh, in the movie. But okay. Father Marin sees him fall into this crevasse in a weird place. Oh. So then, when um, Father Lamont goes back there and is trying to explain to them that he is a friend of Father Marin's and he's seen through Father Marin's eyes. They on talk the wings of a demon. They talk about this monk who this monk who died climbing up trying to save Kakuma, and he goes, "I know where that monk's body is buried, so they can lay him to rest because he's seen where he fell." But they didn't do a good job of making it clear. It looks like he's suddenly bragging. But that is totally yeah, unclear. It looks like he's suddenly bragging about wow. being some kind of like cliff forensics expert out of nowhere. That's yeah. what I thought. He was like, because it bounced on this thing, and I'm like, well, <laughs> like okay. it was very CSI. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, like, all the portraits of white Jesus, which I don't believe would be there. And when he finally (laughs) explains it after all of this, is like, no, I just was there uh, because I was showed this by the demon. They're all like, oh, dude, we we don't fuck with you, bro. (laughs) (laughs) It's one of the many times in this movie where somebody goes from, like, being on board with a plan to being like, fuck you, get away from me, in a heartbeat. (laughs) It also happens. It's the same thing with the uh, psychiatrist, doctor, whatever her name is, where she's like she's like partnering with his priest and they're all on board putting Reagan under. And then immediately after, like they they go under and and she's like, she's like, you stay away from her, you asshole. And He's like, what the fuck did I do? Yeah, I was like, wait, what happened? I thought y'all were friends. Like shit turned. This movie had a few scenes for me where I thought like, oh, yes, like horror stuff is about to happen. And and then it (laughs) doesn't (laughs) stay like. The scene with the psychiatrist in the beginning, when they when they used uh, the, the the glass, the in double the, exposure like, the thing, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the demon shows up for the first time. I was like, here we go. This is what this movie is. It's gonna be like this demon appearing all, all the time. And then I realized it was a different actor in the makeup, and I was like, this, I don't like this. And also, then, <laughs> the more they showed it, it went the on less for way too long. The effects were because when it first popped up, I was like, I didn't even realize it at first. I I thought it was her reflection, and then I was like, holy shit, that's the demon. And I was like. Ooh, that was a good one. I was watching it in the dark last night, and then that happened. I was like, oh, God, I don't know if I could watch this movie. And then that was literally the only time. The only other scare I remember is the locust popping out of the bedroom door. And that was like a jump scare at the end where where he goes back to the house, and he opens the bedroom door, and all the locusts come, which is the same time as the cab driver is getting into a car accident. And I thought that was an effective jump scare, but then it, it immediately devolved into, like, chaos and, you know. 
I, I knew like, so, you know, that tension you were talking about where, where you first see like the demon face and like, there's that weird scene where they're all like in the mind meld and stuff like that. And then she goes and she draws the picture and you're, they're still building up that tension. It's like, Oh shit. Is she drawing some kind of demon picture or whatever? But then the moment I knew I was like, Oh no, fuck this was when they find a little fire in the basement because of the picture or whatever. <laughs> the and then he fire. tries to beat it up. He tries to beat up the fire. Yo! Oh, yes! Oh my god! Thank you for bringing that up. He's gonna beat the fire to death with a and the pair of crutches. And the just standing there looking at him. And so I wasn't the only one who thought like, "Hey, you might have made this worse." It seemed like it was fairly, yeah. it was fairly contained it. until he spread it all over the Adding fucking room. Adding wood to the fire. I also want to know how when she sees the picture and then she looks up and she sees him with fire behind his head. How did fire get from like <laughs> where he was to twenty feet behind him? burning something else behind his head like i know he's not a firefighter but he was the least competent fire combatant i could imagine (laughs) that's what happens when you try to fight fire with your fists (laughs) (laughs) it starts to become like a game of clue like who is the demon in like is it the priest is it sharon let's play who am i in and it turns out it's all of them Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But like the other scene I was going to say when I thought, oh, wow, horror stuff is going to happen was when they call him like a devil worshiper and they start throwing rocks at him. And and then like there's just more and more people throwing rocks. And I'm like, oh, wow, they're going to kill him. He's going to get stoned to death. This is crazy. And then they cut away to something and then they come back and he's like fine he's like sitting at a cafe like talking to someone yeah he's like and then he's like hey you're like a foreigner let's tell each other everything about it yeah i was like like, okay how did he get out of that situation yeah also they're cross-cutting that with tap dancing yeah that that was the scariest part to me that that is what made me believe he was gonna get stoned to death is like the the costumes and and the faces in that fucking tap show (laughs) were so disturbing and i was like that man's getting stoned to death because i am disturbed right now also, they sort of established they they established in the first movie that they will kill off their lead priests, you know, and it, yeah. like which I thought would have been a bold choice, but no, they they did not do that. They they went with the uh, the old. Eh, it wasn't a real stoning; it was kind of a warning stoning. <laughs> the Godfather has train noises. This has tap yeah, exactly. dancing noises. So like, yep. it's yeah. like... he should have got stoned to death because that would have given Sharon and Liz something to fucking do in this movie, even though they're in the whole thing. I was just about <laughs> to say, let's talk about Sharon and the heel turn that she takes. Like, what, what's Sharon's deal? She was fine, a good character the whole way. Nice, sympathetic. Was she there during any of the... Oh, she was there in the first movie. During she was barely she was in first the first star. movie. Yeah. She's like... the She yeah. is the the role that that redheaded girl plays in the psych... The, the, the assistant in the psychiatry office. That's what Sharon was in the first movie. Just, like, there in the background. Yeah. So, the, the Sharon heel turn... Like, technically, I guess they set it up in the scene with Lamont in the house where she basically says, like, she's, like, laughing off the idea of praying as, like, that couldn't possibly help me. You know, I'm I'm so fucked. I'm haunted or whatever. Um, like, it was just showing her that – showing that she's, like, a weak character and she's, like, susceptible to demonic influence, I guess. But once again, it's there a little, kind of, but they don't ever – and listen, I'm not arguing that movies should over-explain themselves, but – you need to give us like a breadcrumb or two to, to follow. This is like, yeah. <laughs> she just turns around and just kills herself. And I'm just like, it's kind of like, like probably she probably yeah. had the heel turn for the same reason that the Cardinal and the psychiatrist both changed their mind about having father Lamont look into things. Cause it's at that point in the script where everyone's got to yeah, be against the him. script got rewritten five times. <laughs> yeah. Cause yeah, I heard he was editing it after it went to theaters, yeah, too. So, oh, so yeah. they realize this is the time when everyone's yeah. got to be mad at the priest, so they make everyone mad at him. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't <laughs> really, it's not much of a setup. Honestly. <laughs> I didn't ask you to investigate, really. It was just. Yeah, was yeah honestly, it was, like, very obvious to me they needed something to cross cut with all the locust footage in the house. Like, all the, like, locust soundstage footage. We got to cross cut something with this. Oh, yeah, a woman burned alive in the very beginning. Let's pretend that that was a setup for this and we'll just burn her alive and yeah okay all right that's a movie (laughs) well it was like there was like a light there right was there something with the light and the burning like you had to burn the light Uh, yeah i I think i once again i feel like there was the nugget of a good idea because i think there was something a little spooky about when sharon gets out of the car and you're like oh no she's on the bad guy's side now and the psychiatrist lady who's one of our main characters might be in trouble except that like they didn't 
they didn't set it up and then they also didn't really pay it off because it's like they didn't it's not like they had some battle that was like full of tension they could have been cross-cutting two tense battles but instead they were cross-cutting a scene where sharon burns herself for some reason with a scene where like if should we talk about how father lamont thwarts the demon at the end because i mean that whole thing is just fucking bananas um bananas yeah, like right from the the weirdest part of the movie the weirdest part of the movie for me was her following him from new york to washington like while he's not saying anything right. it was like this protracted trip they took yeah. via train and bus and as you Did pointed she out bribe that train guy also i, I feel like I she, think she bribed just, him no she just paid for tickets you can buy tickets on the train from the conductor. You yeah. can? Um, okay. Yeah. I, I don't think you can still do yeah. that, can you? Yeah, and that last time I was on a train, you could. Okay, all um, right. Especially those like those ones that are like local, like like regular commuter routes. Um, but anyways, yeah, and once again, they got beat. They traveled by all like train and bus mass transit, and they got beat by plane and taxi, which, yeah. you know. Um, they really should have did, got. Didn't get um, beat by plane and taxi. They really should have got a product placement deal with Amtrak. Like. They really should have. Like, there was, there was like the footage of the planes though was so long. I was yeah. like, I have seen a plane take off. Like, why are y'all taking so long? <laughs> yeah, and also they have like, I guess they're showing Pazuzu's power to like create a windstorm that causes turbulence on the plane. But once again, doesn't actually do anything. You know, it's like false tension. It's like tension where it's like, if for a second we thought they were going to kill these characters, that would be a tense moment. Or if we thought that Pazuzu actually had the power to bring down a fucking airplane. That would be a tense moment, but instead it's just like, oh, there, it's like a lot of noise and, and bullshit. Um, but anyways, so Matt, you want to... The wanna, demon in... Oh, what? I was going to say, you want to talk about the, the finale and sort of set up this final fight with the demon? Um, I don't know if we're there yet. We still have so much to unpack. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> like, the demon in the first movie was so scary because a lot of its power and what it did to kill people happens off camera. You don't see the director die. You don't see the first, the old priest die. He's just dead. And like, I don't know. They just did a really good job of like establishing the horror of of the villain in the first movie. Whereas in this movie, it, I, I, there was no fear at all. Like I, I didn't think it was ever gonna do anything. And also another thing, this movie lacked urgency. There's no reason why they have to get to the house before this happens or whatever or like i felt like at any point reagan could have been like uh, i'm just gonna go home yeah. and go to sleep you <laughs> do your trip yeah. and, uh, i'm handling this know, okay we can we can do this tomorrow yeah. right that's a better day for the mind melt yeah. tomorrow yeah. or you know yeah. I, i'm sure i got some problems but you know it's not holding me back i'm still tap dancing and stuff so like i don't really need this shit yeah yeah we're redoing that tap dance performance since I totally fucked it up for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> They're all pretty pissed. They're all pretty pissed. They think I pretended yeah. to get stoned in the middle. No, not not high. Stoned. The saxophone boy isn't like stoned to, to me anymore, and yeah. uh, it's just it's weird. Oh, that guy. Okay, saxophone yeah. guy. Okay, now yeah. I remember. Now they I share remember a look. Yeah. Okay, it's a plant gotcha. without a payoff. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, I totally yes. agree with you, Matt, because her apartment is so badass. It's like... She would always be wanting to go back there. She wouldn't want to be fucking like, you know, hanging out with this priest guy. They even say that. They're like, she's on the roof where she always yeah. is. <laughs> yeah, and also, this isn't even Father Lamont's job. He was there to investigate the exorcism and try to redeem Father Marin's legacy. Yeah. He got fired by the other priest. Right. Like, way early in the movie. He's got to save Reagan, even though Reagan isn't in any immediate danger. There's just some weird shit going yeah. on. Right. I've got to save her. Yeah, no, he's intense about he it. He's very like Wait, melodramatic uh, in this movie. What is the deal with um, the James Earl Jones transformation moment? Oh yeah, that's a is... that's a great that's a great question. <laughs> I I'd love to I'd love to talk about this. I don't know if I'm going to answer. Do you mean your when question. he suddenly uh, has those like lines? On no, his he face? always has the lines in his face. But uh, but sometimes okay. I thought they were no, gone at one point when he's Co Kokumo and then he's Doctor Kokumo. Yeah, yeah, yeah Doctor Kokumo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love honestly. Like okay, to me, we we've already said it. You know what's great about this movie is that it's high concept and the visuals are fucking amazing. So to me. The entire Africa part is like really what I like the best because it's like got all the crazy visuals and really takes you into like the biggest part of their concept for this, which is like building an entire lore and demonology of this whole demon and everything. And James Earl Jones is fucking awesome. I fucking love him. Um, and 
so we get to the part where he's been searching around in Africa. He, they offer him a prostitute, and he's not into it. And he's, I guess they then they cut away, and then I guess he's still searching or whatever. And he finds Kakuma, and there's spikes on the floor, and Kakuma is wearing a locust headdress, which is fucking awesome. Yeah, it's like a paper mache. It's like a paper mache. <laughs> I'm glad so you brought cool. that up because yeah. I thought it was so ridiculous and awesome. <laughs> the paper mache locust head that he's got on his head. Honestly, K- Kokuma as the character in this scene is really interesting to me. And then Kokuma says, "Walk across the spikes to prove your faith," because I think you're like, I think you're right. like with the demon or whatever. And he's like, "Okay." So then he steps on the spikes and they like pierce his foot and he falls face first into them, maybe dying. Cut to black. Cut to he wakes up on a floor and Kokumo, dressed in glasses, short hair, yes. and a lab coat, picks yes. him up on the floor and says, Hello, nice to meet you. I'm Kakumo. Uh, I think I can help you. Not how did you get in my fucking lab? Not this they happened. They never yeah. address it. Does, they never does this happen all the time? Is this how your lab is? You just find a guy every once in a while laying on the ground, passed out? How did he fucking get there? This is like the there? Wakanda lab. <laughs> like, if you want to get into the lab at Wakanda, like, you have to right, prove that exactly. you're not a demon. And then we'll let you in and show you how the freaking and, and we've got all this work, we've got all this know? like primitivist cliche African bullshit on the outside to make people think that we don't have shit figured out. <laughs> but inside, we're all wearing lab coats and we have like great locust technology. Right. <laughs> you know, locusts are locusts are, are, are supplying power to our flying cars. <laughs> right. This is the locust vibranium. I'm whatever. sorry, but short hair glasses Kakumo has no acknowledgement of any of that. Short hair glasses Kom- Kakumo woke up in a normal bed, had a cup of coffee, came to the lab, found a guy on the floor. This guy on the floor, what? I mean, what's happened? Also, <laughs> also this scene when he steps on the spikes and like you see the spikes come out of his foot. Again, Ooh, horror stuff is about to happen. Yes. And then he falls down yes. and nothing. <laughs> He's still, it's suddenly safe. They all disappear. <laughs> My note for this was like, did James Earl Jones ever live in a cave at all? <laughs> yeah, I'm did so he? Dis- disappointed. I'm so oh, confused. Man. Honestly, I love both Kakumos though. Like mild mannered, like boring ass scientist Kakumo is cool. And so is like the <laughs> fucking warlock Kakumo with the, with the locust headdress in a fucking cave. He's also fucking cool. But... It's really fucking confusing as to what the movie is trying to tell us about both of these Kakumos. He is very confident, whatever he is, James Earl Jones. And he's just like, oh, you just saw nothing. Like, we're just walking in a lab. Like, this is James yeah, Earl Jones him. taking you on a yeah. tour. You can't yeah, he's me. acting like he finds guys laying on the floor of his lab and picks them up and starts talking to them all well, the time. Well, maybe he does. <laughs> if, if, he's got this, if he's got this, like, um, psychic double life as this materi- mysterious uh, salamander-headed or locust-headed uh, Kakumo, maybe he's, like, he's used to, like, seekers coming to, to learn from him and seek his knowledge. Also, it looks like midday. How long was he laying on the floor while they were conducting normal uh, obviously, lab Obviously, <laughs> reality was not the reality that we know it as. Also, we're just getting this. The movie's playing right now still, and we're just getting to this exact scene, and it's and it's still not. Where are we in the any... tap performance at this point? You know? Yeah, Doctor Kakumo. He gets in around nine a.m. He'll have a cup of coffee and he'll check on some of the locusts, look at some of their wings. A lot of times we're going to have a guy passed out in the lobby. We're just going to leave him there until about 11.30, 11.45. Dr. <laughs> Kakuma will come in, talk to him for a little bit, determine if he's somehow you know, involved with some kind of demon possession, something like that. And then he'll usually take him back and have him look at the locusts because uh, you know, that's what we study here. It is. It is like I'm looking at this costume, and it is like I wonder how much research they did into like sort of semi-accurate, you know, c- costumes of the real because it because it looks like something that like the Street Fighter people would design for like oh this guy's from Africa he probably wears like, oh my yeah. god y- it's yes real bad. <laughs> probably wears Everything like shaggy shit all over yeah. him and like they've got like this weird mix of I mean I don't I'm not an anthropologist so I don't know if Kumo's village is based on some reality but it kind of like had this weird blend of sort of hunter gatherer you know tribal warrior stuff but they're agrarian somehow and they're like farmers and i don't it was just a fucking mess i wonder if any anyone put any thought into any of this at all or if they're just like you know africa bunch of black people wearing like loincloths and shit i don't know yeah it was pretty bad again this movie is like people will believe something to a point and then something else is crazy and they won't believe it like like 
Richard Burton asks Kakumo, hey, you fought the Pazuzu, right? And then he's like, eh, that's what they say, you know? And I'm like, <laughs> that's, that's dude, what my mama dude, says. you just like teleported p- places with a weird, you know, thorn in, in Richard Burton's foot. And you're like, eh, I don't know. Uh, maybe Kakumo's real. Yeah. Maybe not. <laughs> I know you're you're at least mentally sitting on that throne in that room with a weird, weird thing in your head. So <laughs> don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about, Kakumo. Were any of you guys as mesmerized by the footage of the locusts, like in captivity? I could have watched that a lot as longer. Me. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was delightful. Um, I'm also at the scene where uh, the doctor, what you, what's, what's her name, Doctor Tuscan, is giving her kids a bath. Also a con- also a confusing, really super confusing cut at the end of this scene. <laughs> Why? Yeah. Well, yeah. then she's then busy. Sharon answers the phone and she's soaking wet, and but she yes, wasn't in okay, the what scene. was yeah, wearing a robe, what was that? and then she answers the door, and she's nipping out, and you're like, <laughs> I was like, what? I uh, yeah, I yes, I don't. Why was she soaking wet? Is she mind melding with? Yeah, that's what the I'm like. I didn't understand if like we've got a woman bathing her kids, and she's wearing a bathrobe, and the phone is ringing in one scene, and then we have another woman walk out of a bathroom in a wet robe and answer a phone in the next scene, but those two things are unrelated like like how is that who thought of that and that that would be a good way to it's not just a wet robe she is soaking wet her hair is soaking no she's soaking yeah at this point in the movie i was like fuck it whatever like but uh, uh, it's way late in the movie (laughs) at this point and like i've already seen i've seen enough i this doesn't look abnormal to me at all at this point i'm just like yeah whatever Maybe that was like Linda Blair wanting to show off her tap dancing. The girl who played Sharon was like, listen, I want my nips to be a little more visible in this movie. I felt like I wasn't nipping out in my shirt enough in the last one. So if you could have a scene where I'm uh, uh, nude or partially nude or at least, you know, some implied nudity, some transparency, that would Maybe be appreciated. Maybe she was jealous of that other scene where they like basically show the other woman's breasts through the see-through shirt. And she was like, I, I have breasts, too. That's true. I doubt that. I doubt that's what it was. I doubt that any of this is the reason for this. (laughs) Which other, wait, which other woman showed her breasts? Well, there's a Linda Blair scene when she's wearing like the nightgown that's separate. Yeah, I mean, she doesn't show her breasts. Oh, yeah, then there's the African woman shows her breasts also. There's there's, there's quite a bit of breasts in this movie, actually. It's kind of strange. Yeah, but so there's a lot of sexualization of Linda Blair in this movie, like, shots lingering on her yeah like how old is she you know she's very soft lighting on her she i don't know i was gonna ask how old she was i want to say 17 in this film that's what i read and the priest felt uncomfortable with the last scene with just so the last scene they well he want they wanted him to go further we can oh, look this her, up but um, you know. this was so this is 77 and she was born in 59 somebody who's good at math do the math for me well, 79, she would be 20, so this is three years. Yeah, she's 17. Okay, so she's 17. Oh, wow. I, I would like to point out that after this, after that, that changes the way I saw the movie to me. Like, she's, they were they were shooting, they were they were portraying her as a, a very adult woman in this movie. Yeah, but okay, yeah. so just for some context, yeah. and also 17 in 1970, whatever, 77, is a little different than 17 now, at least in terms of how it was looked at socially. Um, but she was a sex symbol after the first movie in a way, like she was on the cover of magazines and she started dating Rick Springfield, who sang Jesse's girl at age, at age 15. She met him at a whiskey, a go-go concert. So, and so she was Jesse's girl. I I, I think that was already out at that point, but, um, she was definitely Jesse's next girl, I guess. Um, and, and she, (laughs) and she continued to date like rock musicians all throughout her teens, so she and so like she was out there on magazine covers in like in public wearing skimpy outfits and being, you know, sexy. And this is kind of like part of her image at this point. Um, and she actually ended up a few years later mentioning that she found Rick James sexy in a in a magazine and then ended up dating him for several years. Um, hmm. So so I'm not I'm not saying that it's wrong to sexualize a 17 year old. It is. But at the same time. In the context of where her career was, this wasn't weird, and she probably wasn't fighting it that much, um, for for those reasons. I think, if anything, she was probably pushing to, you know, be more like like get it out there. And I think if you look at what she did after this, it's a lot of really like 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 pretty low budge like throwaway horror stuff. So she was kind of a scream queen type of thing. So that was true or not true did she do softcore porn 
Uh, I, I feel like I heard that somewhere. I don't remember hearing that I don't know. at any time, but it's, it's... Maybe she just did really, like, B movies where... Did she She must have done nudity at some point. I think she did. Uh, well, she was, in the kind of, she was in the kind of horror movies that it would be shocking if there wasn't... Somebody's boobs didn't come out, you know? Yeah. I'm pretty sure she she did nudity in some capacity at some point in her career i will look that up uh, she did she did pose show. for pl- <laughs> she did pose for playboy a couple years after this movie came out but i don't know if that I don't, uh, that that could be it yeah. but I'll, I'll i'll get back to you that's classy that for exorcist <laughs> matt's gonna be our research department for that <laughs> yeah they put her in a lot of silk you know she was really running through the town in, in a silk yeah yes outfit. definitely I, honestly though i i I find it really uh, enlightening that you are not enlightening. I, I find it really interesting that you reference Street Fighter because I see I see her like sexy young girl vibe and Kakumo's costume in that one scene as a very Street Fighter uh, pair of characters. Like Linda Blair's costumes in this are are pretty on point. They're totally unrealistic that like a teenage girl would be wearing these and have so many costume changes, but they are all like high fashion elaborate. I guess her mom's a famous actress in the movie. Her mom's like a rich, famous actress. So maybe she is Is wearing high end stuff. I but. didn't see her mom in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> you, you saw the first movie, Colin. You have no excuse. You know this. Mina might Mina might be confused that they never established any of that. No, but. she's never there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all, right, all right, let's talk about the finale. Okay. Um, I've been I've been waiting so forever. We already kind of talked about the journey to the finale, yeah. the epic, epic. I, I'm like uh, wait, 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 exhausting. wait, wait, wait. We were talking about the black tax, taxi driver. Is it the locust that throw him off the road? Is it just the possession of Sharon in the back seat? Doesn't what, he what punch a on? hole in his own windshield while driving? His windshield shatters, and I watched it a second time, and I don't think there's any. I don't think we know why his windshield shatters. But well, they crash through mm-hmm. a, a gate, a wrought no, iron. No, no, no. That's a result gate, right? of the windshield shattering. Like, he's yeah. driving down the road, and suddenly his windshield shatters, and they go careening out of control for, like, several seconds. So I don't know if his brakes are cut or what, but, like, a, a number of things go wrong, and that it results in him. He, like, literally says to them, we're on the street you wanted to be on, and then the windshield shatters, mm-hmm. and he accelerates into the gate, and they're, like, screaming and rolling around in the back seat the whole time. It's like a prolonged thing. Um but they get to the house. He, he got so, so guess, close to living. He got so yeah. close to living through this. thing. Yeah, he could have been like, "Is if it's if yeah. it's okay, can I just drop you here in the corner?" <laughs> yeah, right. He's like, "You guys can yeah. walk the rest." I'm not of going the near way, that right? haunted I mean, house, you know. No. So <laughs> I I want to go off something Matt said. Um, for years and years when I was young, I used to think it was rod iron, but it's actually wrought iron. <laughs> you thought like it was somebody. It was named after a guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I did. Who invented this fence? Oh, this is a guy Rod Rod Iron. <laughs> he made he made <laughs> all these iron. made all these are Rod Iron fences. Hey, Rod. Rod Iron fences. <laughs> uh, I get my stuff from Bob Iron. Oh no, no. you got to go with Rod Iron. <laughs> that stuff's not even made of iron. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Bob Iron fences. Those are just wood. <laughs> it's like it's like my buddy White Picket who invented a different kind of fence. <laughs> and, and, and Chain Link. He's pretty badass. <laughs> <laughs> Chain Link. We got more Street Fighter characters all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> all, fences, yeah. all fences are just named after whoever invented them. <laughs> and they just happen to have very descriptive names. <laughs> <laughs> That's my boy Chain. Chain Link. <laughs> try to I try to think of like a similar thing that I didn't understand when I was younger. I know there's there are some. Those are always funny when you realize something years later that's so totally wait, not so the way you thought it was. It's been three years in the story, and all the furniture is still in the house, and they put barbed wire on the the, the fence to protect the furniture, Colin. <laughs> yeah. Is it just a house? To me, it seemed like an apartment complex. I, I want to see the story of the real estate agent who was put in charge of trying to resell that thing. <laughs> and just like that. Talk about, you know, talk about Satan coming after you is like, try to resell this house. Yeah, that's yeah, that's 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 your own personal hell right there. Yep. Yeah. It, <laughs> so this is the master bedroom. Uh, there was some light demon possession in here a long yeah. time ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, Selling sunset, yep, right, right here. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, well, now it's an open air um, room, so 
maybe easier to move it, I guess. I, we've got this great balcony space. This, it's got that indoor, yeah. outdoor LA This used vibe, to be a bedroom. Right? They decided yeah. to knock out the walls and make a balcony space. There are, you will find some dead locusts here and there. Uh, we couldn't get them all. Um, a lot of people have questions about the staircase. Um, I have assurances from the city that this is a safe staircase and only occasionally do people break their necks at the bottom of it. <laughs> or, spi- or spider walk down it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's like a brownstone, I guess. It's like a, you know, like a house that's sort of attached to... Oh, okay. Got you. Got you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And apparently the house is important for reasons that are never disclosed, because the house really had nothing to do with why she got possessed in the first movie. And in this movie, if anything, they further establish that it's about her specifically and not about the house. It's also yeah. another part of that story where the director comes in, says he wants to shoot on location in Ethiopia and the Vatican, and says, oh, get me the house from the last time. And they're like, they will not agree to that. We have to build it on a soundstage. And he's like, fine, I'm going to blow it up with locusts anyways. Yeah, <laughs> it's for the best. <laughs> Even the steps, they couldn't get used, you know, they couldn't get, uh, you know, they weren't allowed to shoot on the steps. Yeah. And so they had to re- remake them somehow. Oh, I thought those steps oh looked really God. different. They, they sh- And they shoot them from a completely different angle that they have never showed in the first movie, which is, yeah, is right, why they're exactly. probably trying to hide the fact that it's fake. Yeah, fakers. Bunch of fakers, bunch of phonies, bunch of Hollywood phonies. Yeah, some of those locusts look like they might not even be real locusts. Like the like the uh, the hero lo- the hero locust that they have the locust cam on. I don't think yes. that was a real locust at all. <laughs> I don't either. Mm, well, uh, I was reading that the the ones that came at them at the end are little styrofoam packing peanuts that they painted awesome. brown with I a love fan. That. I love that so, idea. It looks really there good. You go. Yeah. It did look good. It looked cool. I enjoy, I really enjoyed the practical effects. I was like, ooh, we're on a Universal Park theme ride. You know, let's do I, it. I like the yeah. pa- practical effects a lot more than the, like, double exposures and, um, like, the gr- the blue screen stuff they did. Uh, that that did not age as well as the practical stuff. Oh, I'm watching the Arsenio Hall scene right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which goes on for way too long. Honestly, at the point at the point we got to in the movie where she starts doing the arm whooping and all the locusts are gathered around, and and I was already like w- with the cross cutting with the woman on fire and and the whole like weird sexual tension with the priest and the and her double and all that stuff. I'm like I'm ready for this movie to be over. Like let's let's see the resolution. Let's have her end it. For her to end it that way, I was really pumped. I was totally psyched. I was you like, were "Yeah, pumping your fist." <laughs> yeah, I was like, "Can yeah. we just?" I can actually can we like stop this. for a second and imagine <laughs> what it would be like for her to film that scene. Like she literally just spun around in circles, going like this, with them blasting debris at her with fans and shit. Her hair going all over the place for like it must have been hours. Yeah. We also know they had real locusts too. The one thing it's got going for it is real that locusts. She, yeah, Arsenio hadn't done his show for many years after this so um at least she didn't know that she was going to be mocked for doing an arsenio hall hand gesture at the time wow well well it was it was what you were talking about it was the payoff and then the plant right right. yeah Yeah, exactly it's a real life payoff and plant years later they were like see this is what we're going for we were going for an arsenio hall thing honestly you get arsenio hall linda blair all of us in a room joking about it and i I guarantee you they'll say I we wouldn't have done it any other way. We're we're proud of what we did with the whooping, uh, especially the locusts, especially those all those night shows. Whooping's here to stay, and and whooping is something that we can all be proud of. <laughs> so is the whooping what kills the locust, or is it pulling the heart out? Or so is let's it talk both? about both. Like... What exa- let's set, set this up a little, Matt. Can you can you sort of talk through what is going on in this finale and like as best you can describe what they're trying to do and what is actually the conflict. You're asking the wrong person. I was just going to ask you guys what the fuck is going on in this scene. No, Matt, you have to do it. You got to ask first. Well, I mean, if I learned anything from this movie, it's that ripping someone's heart out is simple. (laughs) You just like, I mean, this is how, so to set it up a little bit, they, they go into the room where Linda Blair was possessed Linda Blair and the priest go into a room where Linda Blair was possessed, and they find a possessed Linda Blair there, which never gets any explanation how there is now two Linda Blairs. And then the possessed Linda Blair turns into a regular Linda Blair. So now it's just like double Linda Blairs in the room. And one of them is is wearing demon contact lenses. So that's a bad one. Pazuzu. And she, yeah, that's Pazuzu. And she's trying to seduce Lamont. And the other one is trying to help Lamont, but the seducing one is trying to get 
Lamont to strangle the good one. So that's the setup. And Lamont for a second goes and like starts making out with, um, he doesn't really make out with her. He sort of like, s- like motorboats her a little bit. Um, <laughs> I thought it was just the, the neck. Fake yeah. It was like the like, neck, maybe the decolletage. I don't know if he goes into full cleavage, but yeah, um, <laughs> definitely, definitely there's a sexual element to whatever it is he's doing as, which is good to yeah. know that Richard Burton yeah. felt uncomfortable because he should, he was like a man in his <laughs> late fifties, early sixties, I don't know if this yeah. is between marriages to Liz- <laughs> he died like five years after. Yeah, this I, I don't know if this is between between marriages to Liz Taylor or or if he was currently married to her. But um, but yeah, it definitely would have been a weird situation for him. I think. Um, um in other movies, does Richard Burton have a beard? Like on his face, I, I can't think of one. Uh, every time I can think of him, he didn't have a beard. Um. But I, I can't really. He ain't no hippie, huh? I just no, didn't. I, like when I watched the movie, I didn't immediately go like, "Oh, that's Richard Burton." I was like, "Oh yeah, um, I think I've seen this guy before." I'm trying to think of what his most famous. He was in Julius Caesar, is like one of his most famous roles, I think, because um, mm-hmm. he played Mark Antony. Yeah, I have so that seen was the lead. He was also in um, what I know him best for is the film version of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, which he starred in with his wife Liz Taylor, who he was married to twice. Um, and I think that was during one of their marriages. And um, that was, I think, you know, if you ever want to know, like, why people consider Richard Burton or Liz Taylor good actors, that movie is like a master class on just like, like roles that demand overacting and people just totally pulling it off. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I liked his acting in this scene if it was like a one man show. Or I mean, in the in the whole movie, basically, his acting was amazing. If it was a one man show, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, if you just take everything. or if like if, if he was if he was live and the rest of the movie was projected behind him, he he would be really bringing something to this. But like so many, I, I just like I don't think the performances are that bad. It's the writing. It's just like so many of the things yeah. they say is like you're obviously saying this basically to the audience you're you're doing a monologue except it's written as a conversation because you're taking turns and you're both in the scene i do think better actors could have sold it better cuz i think richard burton does sell it better than than the other actors in this movie who aren't as good as richard burton on the other hand, you are totally right. That's exactly what this dialogue is, and it's why it doesn't work. Uh, I just saw the scene where they get into the taxi cab, and the taxi cab driver asks them where they're going, and they say it, and he just sort of looks at them, and he asks again. He's like, are you sure? And then he just sort of says there, and they get, imp- they get impatient with him, and he really knew all along. Um, also, I forgot that Sharon's wearing a weird head wrap in that scene. <laughs> what is that all about? Between, be- yeah, she loses it yeah, later. Well, her hair was wet. It's, you know, so. it's very, very she strange. <laughs> um, so, anyways, Richard Burton f- d- decides to fight the demon, and the way he fights the demon is by literally punching her heart out of her chest. He just punches, <laughs> punches her yeah. repeatedly yep. until his hand penetrates her chest, and he rips his heart out. Which is like, is that like the trick? I hate when something is like a supernatural thing or a fantastical thing, and the solution to beating it is just to physically beat it to death. Like, is this the? <laughs> well, see, you know what, Harris? To- you were wrong about. You were wrong about them being Street Fighter characters. It was Mortal Kombat all along. Yeah. <laughs> like, if the secret to beating a demon is to punch its heart out of its chest, that's not really a trick. That's the secret to beating anything. If you can yeah. punch, yeah. if you can punch something's heart out of its chest, you're gonna win that fight. I figured out its weakness. As soon as it started, I had my fingers crossed that Malaram from fucking Temple of Doom was gonna just yeah. pop, just just open the door and walk in. Do it like this. <laughs> what is the chant? What is you the chant? Well, well into this world. <laughs> oh, Kali, Kalima. Kalima. Uh, yeah. Kalima. Kalima. Oh, God. Oh, please. That that movie did terrible things for representation for brown people. Yeah. I I love that movie growing up. It's, it, yeah. It sucks that What, it's Temple not. of Doom? Oh, yeah. Except the, oh, yeah, except the blonde woman is like, half her lines are just screaming and it's really annoying. <laughs> She's so annoying, so annoying. In fact, that Spielberg married her after <laughs> then divorced wow. her. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I don't. I don't see how you direct that movie, and you're like, I want to marry her. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's the strangest. You, listen, thing. Kate Capshaw has been in other movies where she isn't screaming hysterically all the time. I think that was her direction. <laughs> like, like I think he was like, listen, you are too pretty and attractive. I think the only way we're we're gonna have the audience not be distracted by your beauty is if you are the most annoying character in this film. 
<laughs> so that God. maybe that's Spielberg's kink. He's into like <laughs> women screaming. Yeah, just shriek hysterically <laughs> at all yeah, times. Yeah. That's it, baby. Shriek hysterically for me. Who's your daddy? No, no, don't tell me. Just shriek Ooh. it. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Andy! <laughs> and then, so let's wrap this thing up. So can someone explain to me like the, the closure of this movie? Like the resolve? Every, everything you know, like everything to... works out. Everything turns out just like the first one. Everything's fine. <laughs> So they rip the heart out. The the buildings collapsed. Uh, The cops and a bunch of like neighbors. The neighbors finally show up after she was screaming in the streets for someone to help. Wait, where does she leave Sharon's body? Is it just on the, the side of the road? The psychiatrist goes to the. She's like huddled on a porch across the street, and the shrink and the shrink goes right, to like right, wrap right, a towel right. around her and comfort her. And she's like, "Oh, I'm, I failed everyone. I failed Reagan." And the priest is like, "No, doubting was your truth, or something like that." I, I don't know. Here's what I don't understand. She's literally out in the street screaming in the windows of the other houses during this whole no thing. No one comes out. And and, and no even one. after all it all ends, there's all no the one. No one out on the street. And then in an instant, hundreds of people are behind her. It was crazy. What the hell is that? It was crazy. I don't know where the body went. I don't know where all these people came from. Oh, yeah. you know what I just realized when we were talking about the acting? What about the woman in the scene where she realizes her daughter can talk? Yeah. That, she Colin, can talk. Colin, I wish I could show you my notes because my notes on that were, oh, my God, autistic mom just ran away with the worst actress award for this movie. That was like, it was like, there was, it was a competitive field, but she left no doubt. She, she lapped the competition. This movie set back any, you know, d- oh, yeah. autistic people. Representation like, of like, autism was, yeah. I don't yeah. think, scientifically accurate or even, like, fantastically accurate. No, yeah, no, my notes are just all caps. <laughs> She's talking! <laughs> <laughs> and, she, and she, her daughter oh, talks to her for the first time ever, and what does she do? She turns away and collapses onto the desk rather than, like, be happy uh-huh. about her like talk to her more she's like she spends more time talking to the fucking nurse in that scene than she does to her daughter she's like we have to show my husband it's like okay and yeah, yeah and then more dialogue that doesn't make sense they keep having a conversation she's like okay we're gonna go i'm gonna show my husband no i think maybe you should stay here no i'm gonna show my husband like <laughs> you just wasted my time script screenwriter thank you <laughs> if, if you wanted to if you wanted yeah. to like have a great example of your contention that the dialogue is poorly written in this movie just show somebody that scene and be like find me actually actors that can yeah. make this work like these actors are terrible <laughs> but even if they were good this would not work so i might have been nodding off at this point but during that scene is there any indication that she uses some sort of like sensory power she's just having a no, conversation no. she's with the just girl, talking right? yeah. she's just talking yeah yep. yeah i thought so yep that's stupid she's like it was like she just was like talking quietly and it's like i thought it was like about like yeah. shyness or she, something. yeah so but yeah no. she's it's one of her many powers that we don't explain or ever reference again she says i'm autistic right yeah yeah yes she whispers that to I'm her autistic. Yeah. oh yeah yep. i feel like they don't yeah. say that also i forgot how much i hate so of all the bad parts of linda blair's performance seductive linda blair is the worst. She just keeps on like, <laughs> she just keeps on winking and scrunching up her nose and like <laughs> tilting her head like this over and over again. Like, <laughs> it's oh just yeah, so that's bad. Bad. <laughs> That's not seductive. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like I think she saw <laughs> she saw <laughs> something what? do somebody similar once. Something similar once. She was like, okay, so seduction is scrunching your nose and winking and like flitting your chin forward over and over again. I I like the straightforward forward and forwardedness of it. Fuck, what is the word I'm trying to say? I like how straightforward it is. Yeah, she's not fucking around. Yeah, like, if I saw a woman do that, I'd be, I would definitely accept it. I'd be like, good job flirting, because I really, I know that you're flirting for sure. Yeah, listen, but it, it does, <laughs> it, one, one thing is, you're not going to worry about that, like, if it's a priest, there's a pretty good chance that it's you're not his audience. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not making any I'm not making any priest pedophile jokes, but I am in <laughs> but I am implying them. And this movie kind of reinforces that cuz he's got both the leads, both the female leads throw themselves at Richard Burton in this movie. And he's and he's like I I still my favorite line in the entire movie is her going, "Don't you ever find you need a woman?" And he thinks about it and he just goes, "Yes." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the, both both the movie, both Exorcist movies so far deep 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 subtext is like priest sexuality 
Yeah. We all want to like, fuck priests, time. but they don't want to fuck us. What's, what <laughs> well, gives? <laughs> I was so worried. I was so worried when he went on his priest break. You know, I was like, ooh, that usually doesn't mean a good thing. They transfer yeah, yeah, you exactly. somewhere else. And, like, you, you, <laughs> I was like, My God, ooh, if, only the, if only the priest breaks and transfers were because they did unauthorized exorcisms, that would be like, oh, I, <laughs> yeah. I, my faith that's, in the world is that's restored. All <laughs> that's all it is. That's all it is. But, like, literally <laughs> at that point in the script, the, like, who the cardinal or whoever he's talking to he's just telling her like tell, telling the cardinal like i need to keep following around this 17 year old girl <laughs> so the cardinal's <laughs> like yeah we're <laughs> you're, yeah, we're you're, you're, you're going you away yeah. Yeah. i've, yeah. I've yeah. heard this one before yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah no we can't we can't even send you to africa yeah. no that's not happening either yes no. keep following yeah. that that <laughs> 17 year old boy yeah. I, I said girl oh it's a girl uh, <laughs> well that's weird it's a girl you said oh I'm sorry uh, I guess go ahead I don't know uh, probably wrap that up yeah. weird but sure you do you father oh man should we uh, should we rate this I, thing I think we should oh wait we were going to okay. talk about things we learned did you want to do your oh yeah did you learn oh. anything I already told uh, you what I learned. I know what I want. I know what I learned. I'm ready for this. Whenever it's my turn, I'm not gonna lie. I did not prep Mina for this segment that we. Oh, did. I didn't. I didn't know this was a teachable moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, it doesn't have. It does, we don't, don't have to talk about things we learned. I did learn that I, I don't think it's cultural appropriation if you brought you bought your Af- African garb at the, like a tourist <laughs> gift shop or something. Um, <laughs> Um, the best way to kill a, a demon is yeah. punching its heart out, I guess. I I don't, you know. And obviously, the the Arsenio hand whoop as a way to stem off. I think probably all all plague attacks, but cer- certainly yeah. locust. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. a good yeah. COVID nineteen. Yeah. We're all out in the streets. Just like, yeah. Fuck these masks. Right. I'm doing my hand whoops. <laughs> has, has Arsenio yeah. has not been infected, as as to my knowledge. <laughs> yeah, so. That's true. I haven't heard that. It's, yeah. it's working. Yeah. In fact, it's he's working. coming back in uh, coming to America. <laughs> coming to America. Doing better than ever. Then he's coming out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of people aren't coming to America now because of COVID. Also. <laughs> so that's a thing. It's true. Yeah. Um, what I learned about this movie is I fucking love James Earl Jones so much in everything he does. Yeah. I like. I don't know if you guys are like this, but I've seen Field of Dreams a lot of times, and one of my favorite moments, maybe in cinema history, is when. <laughs> Costner turns the bus around and he's standing in the street in the headlights and he just goes, Moonlight Graham. <laughs> and Costner goes, You saw it. <laughs> well, I, my favorite moment is when he goes, You said your finger was a gun. <laughs> yeah, I like that too. <laughs> yes, James Earl Jones, great in everything, even but, this trash fire. Yeah. But honestly, like in day to day life, I f- often find myself imagining and fantasizing. I'm just going to like turn a corner or turn around or something, and James Earl Jones is going to s- be like right up in my face. Moonlight Graham! <laughs> <laughs> I often fantasize that like um, maybe if I tried really hard, I could talk like James Earl Jones. You know, just lower my voice, and just, you have to be really down in the register and you have to enunciate really well. But I, I don't think I could pull it off. But al- also, coming to America. You know, so the 1200s, the 1600s, the one constant throughout history has been baseball. <laughs> you get it? Because baseball is not was not around in the Middle Ages. Okay, 1400 <laughs> BC. <laughs> America is rolled by like a steamroller. <laughs> so, is that all we learned? Should we do our? Uh, should we do our? What did I wait? Hold on. I think I learned that. It, you can't just put a lot of more more metaphors don't help the movie. There was like, you know, four different metaphors for what was happening. And I, yeah, it was I too did many. get that, which I think is kind of cool, is the idea that demons are like a swarm of locusts and human beings are like the single locust. Uh, and that was a theme. And it, it was kind of a cool, interesting way to... Um, you know, uh, put like a. But also, of... that analogy falls apart if you think that the individual good locusts are trying to make the swarms of locusts better. Yeah, I don't know if that. Well, works. you, you got to have special powers yeah. to do that. It's you all a muddle. To... It's a muddled <laughs> mess. I just want to throw out before we do the yeah. rating. I just want to throw out one more thing, which may take you guys' ratings from bad to great. 
because it's one of those things that mm. I mean flips the whole movie on its head. So do you guys recall? Here we do go. you recall the last shot of the movie? The oh yeah, with the flashing light. It's not over. It's, it's yeah. Not it's over. it's the psychiatrist standing there watching the wreckage and the a light starts flashing on her like the hypnosis light and the tone starts playing, which makes you think: Is that entire movie some hypnotic, hypnotic suggestion? Did any of it really happen? Is maybe all these plot holes and unexplained things that happen because we're in her dream fantasy sequence? Fever dream? <laughs> a, 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 la, a, a la Mulholland Drive, where it's like she actually died there in the first hypnotic sequence. She had a heart attack, and we're just all in her dying moments watching a fantasy oh, play out. Oh, that's when she that died. That would be cool if that first scene didn't suck so bad. Is this actually just <laughs> a brilliant, brilliant um, movie like that? Is this actually one of the greatest mindfuck movies ever? Just some food no, for thought. Just because they did that doesn't mean it's it's great. Like it just means they did a no, good I mean, thing. <laughs> is it, it, I mean, your options would be: Do you believe that they are intentionally saying that with the ending, or do you believe that, like so much of this movie, they were like, "Hey, well, you know what would be cool if we flashed that light and made that weird noise again at the end?" Just because. No, the no I believe. I believe they did it intentionally, but I believe that they did yeah. such a bad job with so many other things that it doesn't matter. <laughs> like and it is cool that, that it final is cool shot harris just to jump off what you said about the final shot um i thought it was really cool it, there are a few shots in this movie where i actually had the thought of like wait is this actually a great movie you know like, <laughs> <laughs> this shot is so nice i think like, the fact I that it made you think that means that it's not a bad movie it's it's something uh, again like and i'll say this in my summary like i don't think i wouldn't call this like i wouldn't call this terrible movie you know it, it it's a movie but it just misses the the mark. Do you want to just bit, jump you know? into your summary, or do you want? Uh, Colin obviously has his mind made up. So, do you want to go first, Colin? Yeah, I'll go. I'll go. I, uh, I before you jump in, I was just gonna say one more thing. I learned is that I'm really deeply interested in the daily ins and outs of the life of a locust. Yeah, okay, I knew go. I knew you were gonna say that. I knew you were gonna say that. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta look up my like, n- Nat Geo, see if there's a special I can watch. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, yeah. since I turned the movie off, I keep like every my mind just keeps circling back every once in a while drifting to like, man, locusts are really interesting. <laughs> like you know, like every twenty twenty five minutes I'm like, yeah, like normal stuff I'm thinking about and like, you know what? Locusts, man. Um okay Honestly, like, I really do sympathize with what you guys are saying. Like, this movie, like, having, like, a really fucking cool concept and being really fucking visually cool and having, you know, like, just... uh, This is my kind of movie to like, even though it's bad, and I do. And I really like it, and I have a strong feeling, even though I haven't seen the rest of The Exorcist ones... When we finish the series, the only one I'm going to want to go back and see again is probably this one. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, but I have to, like, you know, criticize what's there to criticize. And they did a really bad you job. Didn't feel on... that, you didn't feel like you had to criticize that <laughs> shitty things in Moonraker. I would just like to point out that there are plenty of, <laughs> there are plenty of terrible movies that you felt no need to, to be critical of at all. Go I on. Don't, I don't... Re- I don't recall the events you're speaking of. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what Harris is talking about. I'm just <laughs> Maybe he's under some sort of hypnotic trance. We don't know. Uh, he's talking! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but Harris, Harris definitely couldn't speak before this <laughs> talking. That's how, how we know Harris. I've got to bring him home to his father. Exactly. What's that? You want, you want him to stay here? I still All want right. to bring him home to his father. Right, Why Colin, are we doing Colin, this? Enough, enough, enough rehashing. You're not going to get the part, Colin. I'm sorry. It's a pass. We found a very good older actress to play this role. So Fuck, I, want, I need this part. I need the part. <laughs> Finish your thing. I need it. Um, okay. So like, We're getting look. to the bad part. Why this movie is bad, it tells the story... I, I I read the whole Wikipedia plot section of the story, and I and I read it and I was like, yeah, that is technically the story I saw, but those paragraphs did a way way better job of telling me that story than this did, and it visually it looked cool. There were a bunch of stuff that's like I like I wish I had a poster of what James Earl Jones like looks like in the 
in in both the doctor's outfit and the fucking locust headdress and stuff. Like I would put that <laughs> on my really fucking the, wall. The Clark Kent of I was, our time. I want yeah. him in the doctor's outfit, but also sitting on the throne in the mind. Oh cave. yeah, exactly. Or I thought you were gonna say him in the doctor's outfit, but he just like With the headdress for on. some reason has the headdress <laughs> yeah. on. Yeah, and he's like, come into my office, please. <laughs> Wouldn't Oops, it be awesome if your doc- you went to your doctor and he was just wearing a locust headdress for no reason? It's like step right this way, please. <laughs> yeah. Not until he takes you into the little room. Like, he looks normal, but then once he gets you in a room alone, he just puts it on before he starts speaking. With no explanation. And he refuses <laughs> yeah. to talk about it. Yeah. Oh, man. That's that's the kind of health care we need in this country. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't get political, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to say the stuff I'm trying to say in my notes, and I can't get yeah, there. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Okay, like, basically what we have is... The scenes and and particularly the places and the settings are never established in any meaningful way. Every time we jump cut, we're just in a new place. And oftentimes we have the characters explaining why we're there after they're already in the scene. And sometimes we don't. And they're just saying confusing shit that doesn't make sense and is super awkward. And then it's... Basically, we go in, we're, we think we're watching Exorcist 2, this is a horror movie, it's not a horror movie, it's a sci-fi movie, and honestly, that's really cool, and like their concept was amazing, but they're in a sci-fi movie, like what I was saying before, like especially with things like the, the hypnotic device that allows for mind melts and stuff like that, you have to explain the rules or the, the mechanics of how it works, just like a little bit in some way because at the point when they bust that thing out it not only looks cheap and stupid because it's a fucking light bulb on a stick um it's you, we're still in a place where we've never been explained where the fuck we are like this is some sort of psychiatric institute but there's no way to like say that you know that that's where you are until much later in the movie you just know that it's got like cool fucking sliding doors and Miss Ra- Nurse, Nurse Ratchet is there or whatever and that's all you know and they don't explain the thing and then they start coming into mind melds and they're, they're fucking playing musical chairs during the first scene they use it the priest switches out with the it's like how does he know how to use this when he didn't even know what it was when he walked in the it's like stand back room. I'm a priest and, <laughs> and yeah and we still don't know what it is as the audience because no one fucking explained this thing to us except like it's a magical hypnotic machine I don't know uh, what you didn't they understand barely, about this machine. <laughs> they barely I mean, say that. I feel like that. you got everything that you needed to know out of it. You do understand it's, it. it in, in a sci-fi movie, you have to do some kind of explaining of the connections between the science, the pseudoscience, and the supernatural. That's my how rebuttal, I feel My about rebuttal it. is nah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know why you feel that way. You actually got Leonard Nimoy to come back and do the wub 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 sound effect <laughs> yes, for it. <laughs> I would love that. That would be so much better. Um, and yeah, the dialogue is extremely awkward. It's really, really bad. It makes the actor's job way harder because um, they have to do monologues in the middle of their scenes and their characters aren't talking to each other and their characters have to either explain or confusingly not explain where they are and what the fuck is going on. And all of that makes it a bad movie even though I would definitely watch it again and I would like not have a problem showing it to someone um because it's fucking fascinating and it's visually amazing and it's a high concept but it's still a bad movie because it wants to tell you a story and it does not do a good job of telling you the story and so i will give it uh oh i have to give my rating now right on the yes. on the dolphin scale yeah how many uh, Timothy dolphins mm-hmm. six <laughs> it's way six, high six what <laughs> Timothy Dolphin. Um, yeah, J- just so you know, Mina, like I usually don't give very low scores. Um, <laughs> I could have, I could have easily given this a three, but I'm like feeling generous. Familiar with the, it's just the one one to scale, ten. So I, I uh, it's a Timothy Dolphin scale. So um, it's the actor Timothy Dalton, who is a James Bond guy. Um, since we started out as a James Bond podcast, we called ourselves License to Watch, which is a play on License to Kill. So we wanted our, our rating scale to be Timothy Dalton's. One out of ten Timothy Dalton's. But I'm giving you the credit that this was an established scale, but okay, got yeah. it. Yeah. One one of us. Here, I got, I got the picture. Timothy Can you still Dalton. See my thing? 
it's there he yeah, is right there. Dolphins. It is a universally <laughs> acknowledged scale. This is it's not just all random. It's it's pretty scientific actually. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really uh, Dr. Kakumo uses it. That. Yeah, every movie does have kind of a, a standard Timothy Dol- Dolphin value. <laughs> Yeah, um, like basically like one Timothy Dolphin per every like fifty five, sixty five hundred locusts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. That, I'm clear. I'm crystal clear. All right, I, I'll I'll go next if uh, if everyone's okay with that. Um, now that Colin's got it out of the way, so um, so there's no denying that this movie is kind of a mess. I, you know. I don't think that anybody watches this and says, like, this is a really well-made film. <laughs> that person is probably suffering from a head injury and probably needs to talk to Linda Blair and get that straight. She's talking! <laughs> Gene, Dr. Gene. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Richard Burton is, like, is the only not terrible actor. And, I mean, James Earl Jones isn't given anything to do, and it just everyone kind of sucks. It's it's not it's not good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the score, like I said, Ennio Morricone, great composer. This is not his best work. Uh, but I feel like I really love this. It reminds me a lot of, of like movies like um, I already said, The Dead Zone and Brainstorm and Altered States and Hideaway that take like sort of a, a sci-fi premise and turn it in kind of like an adventure action movie. And that is so my kind of movie that the premise alone was scoring so many points that even botching the premise horribly couldn't take those points away from me. So like, I actually really did like that about it. Um, it, it, and it, it, the funny thing is it hits all the right plot beats to be a satisfying movie for that. It just fucks all of them up and kind of doesn't make any sense while it's doing it. Um, like, like, like we said, the rules, the goals, the stakes are unclear and the ending is like haphazard and confusing. And also I wasn't terribly invested in it or any of the characters, but like on the other hand, but on the, yeah, on the, aside from all of that, <laughs> yeah. it, it looked solid film. It looked fantastic. <laughs> it, like it looked so good. It looked great. It's like, so some of the scenes are so absurd, but yet they're so watchable because it looks good. And it's like, I don't know. It's just really well shot. Um, it's, it's an awful movie, but it's also an awful movie that, like, we've watched decent movies that I never want to watch again. Like, a lot of the Star Trek movies aren't bad, but I would never watch them again. And we've watched a lot of awful movies that I certainly don't want to watch again. This is an awful movie that I definitely, just like Colin, it's in my notes, Colin, I'm not just copying you, but, like, you hit the nail on the head. It's a bad movie that I would happily watch I've watched it twice. I would happily watch it a third time. If this was a movie that was on TV all the time when I was growing up, I would have such nostalgic affection for it, and I would be, and it would be like, it would be like an eight for me. Um, but uh, and it, yeah, it's not that scary. But really, neither is The Exorcist. You know, like these aren't terribly scary movies. This one isn't trying to be scary, and it succeeds in not not being scary. <laughs> so I uh, sympathetically give it six Timothy Dolphins, just on the basis of. It being something that I enjoyed, and it looked great. Um, so, Colin, we are in, like, 100% agreement on everything but the crappiness of the technology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a rare one. Like, mark this episode down, because it's so rare. that, And still, Colin and I managed to fight for almost the entire episode, but in the end, I think we agree on almost everything. Yeah. We said basically the same stuff. <laughs> Who knew that Exorcist 2 would be our most controversial episode? <laughs> Um, Mina, you want to take a crack at Ooh, summarizing uh, your thoughts? Yeah, let me let me see. I I don't think I would. I mean, you guys, I, I don't think I would watch it again for pleasure. <laughs> there's certainly what other reasons? There's certainly there's, masochism. I mean, like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I really wanted to unpack like the things that the directors were doing with like the reflections and like the use of whatever in like the foreground the background. <laughs> Yeah, I think if I even in a classroom that, setting, if your professor was like, "We're going to watch Exorcist 2, you'd be like, "Fuck, I've seen this. I'm <laughs> skipping this class." <laughs> yeah, I, I, but I, I could watch it for that maybe and fast forward through the strobe light parts. Um, but uh, you know, to 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 see about the, the you know, look at how double exposure is done. Sure, um, but. The story just fell apart too much for me, and it was—it just felt like too many different films. When they, the locust and the Africa, and the science versus faith, and um, I just—I don't know. 
Um, plus the Broadway tap dance. That was a minus um, for you? I thought that was like a big advantage. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, and also tap dancing. I don't know. <laughs> that, was, that was the I, scariest part of I the movie. I don't know. <laughs> That's scary. Um, I, I was into Richard Burton's performance. I, I, I didn't know what he was so afraid of, but I believed it, you know? Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I still unsure of the Dalton scale, but I, I think I would give it a four because I just, I don't think I share the same pleasure of, of rewatching, uh, that feels like a fair do. score, yeah. honestly, even though I, I gave it a six, <laughs> I can see a four yeah. though. <laughs> yeah. Like I told you, like I, I if in a lot of ways, I probably should have given it a three, but I definitely gave it a six, so whatever. In, in a lot of ways, I was kind of surprised <laughs> you went that low. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard to be mean. Everyone wants their dolphin. Well, I think I lean a little more towards where Mean is coming from. <laughs> um, I, you know... You guys have pretty much said everything that can be said about this, but I, I, I do want to reiterate that I commend this movie and the filmmakers of this movie for trying to do something different enough from the first one. I'd like to put myself in the shoes of the filmmakers and imagine what I would do had I been hired to make a sequel to like this highly regarded horror movie. And I think I would probably try to do something different. But the difference between me and them is I would try to keep it still a horror film. Um, and I would try to remind audiences why they came to see a sequel to this movie in the first place and put elements in the movie that reward the viewer for like <laughs> being interested in the continuing of this franchise. You could have stopped at reward uh, the viewer. <laughs> <laughs> the the reward was Locus. Sharon showing up yeah. soaked. You know that was it. That was. Yeah. Uh, I just feel like this movie, for all all the like things they tried to do, it just sincerely missed the mark. And like it, it feels like a movie that was being written as they were shooting it, which which we it, know was. it was. Yeah, um, and I think it just you know there's there's nuggets of good in there. Like they're trying to say something about the inherency of like good within evil or like, you know, good does good does ultimate good, like create ultimate evil or beget ultimate evil or something. But they don't, again, like, like kind of, I think Colin said it, that like reading the Wikipedia breakdown of it is more compelling on paper than the actual movie itself like take the last scene for instance if you know if i told you like oh man the finale is sick they go back to the house from the first movie there's like sh a clone of her that an evil clone and you know all these locusts burst through the wall a girl lights herself on fire for some reason there's like crazy shit going on they you know and then she they rip someone's heart out and and then she like waves her arm dramatically and that makes everything go back to normal <laughs> I feel like on paper, if you read that, you'd be like, this finale sounds sick. Yeah. <laughs> but then just the delivery of it is so the opposite of that. Um, yeah. And then again, like missed opportunity with the set of the psychiatrist's office with all the, you know, glass walls, moving walls and stuff. Like I for sure thought that something, some set piece was going to happen in that room. Uh, I thought the finale was going to be there, but they totally didn't do anything. That and the rooftop. Some, I mean, it's a horror movie, and you've got a rooftop that's up high. Throw someone off of it, you know? <laughs> someone can die there. This isn't rocket surgery. It's so simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the one Ethiopian um, guy fell off a cliff. Yeah. So we could get a CS. Yeah, but so again, we could get like, a CSI episode later. Yeah, we really invested in that character. Spatially, like the first time we see yeah. that, it's hard to even tell that we're where we are, that we're up high. It just feels like we're between rock walls, you yeah. know. And you're yeah. like, what is this? And then someone sl in slow motion falls down, and you're like, in, in regular speed okay. in slow motion. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, the way yeah. the way that priest is like pinned with a bunch of guys in between two rocks, it feels like another one of these like weird like priest sexuality <laughs> subtext things <laughs> for a minute there. I'm between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. I want to now. I'm really curious about Colin's idea of sex. 
like, you know, you, you know, you wedge yourself between two rocks with somebody else and just sort of, yeah. just sort of grind a little bit, so and then you fall to your death. <laughs> Brokeback Mountain, there it is. It's not. <laughs> yeah. You don't knock it till you tried it. Yeah. <laughs> You're a man now. Yeah. I, I think. Know. I think my biggest disappointment with this movie is that I feel like had they actually, you know, thought about it and put the time and effort into the story before shooting, there could have been a uniquely different and interesting movie here. But I feel like what we got was, as Harris called it, like a mess, a hot mess, and uh, ultimately a forgettable romp. <laughs> um <laughs> I I have no choice but to award this film the coveted four Timothy Dolphin. <laughs> That's still very generous. So it's gonna it's gonna average out to a five then I guess. Not not yeah. bad for the worst film of the franchise. I think this is encouraging. I feel like this is this is probably the worst John Borman film I've ever seen. <laughs> well, have you seen Zardoz? I have not, but I'm looking forward to it. I actually have that. Um, I, and I've been meaning to watch it because I've what I've heard about it is that it's not as bad as it's like obviously Sean Connery in that outfit is amazing, um, so that's like a plus. Uh, and then you know, well, I'm interested to see it too, so maybe it's our yeah, bonus maybe we should movie. do that as a bonus movie. Have you guys oh, ever seen man. Point Point Blank with Lee Marvin? That's mm-hmm, John no. Borman's best movie. That is a fun one. It's the one they actually remade that as Payback with Mel Gibson. Oh. I've seen Payback with Mel Gibson. Oh, cool! And actually, the Limey, the the um, a Steven Soderbergh movie, which is also an awesome, amazing movie, was heavily inspired by Point Blank. Hmm. Hmm. So John Borman, I actually not, feel very, very strong director. Not his best work, but yeah, he kind of had a miss. He did Deliverance, and then followed that up with Zardoz, which is like also considered a terrible film. And then this movie. And then I don't know what he did really after that, but um, I think he was probably Deliverance is a good. He movie. was probably better off working on like with limited resources and like smaller scope. I think it. I feels it feels like all the movies I can think of of his that I think are pretty good were not like over the top, high concept, you know, crazy stuff going on. But who knows? Uh, I watched um, The Rock with Nicolas Cage and and Sean Connery today. And I really considered heavily just like trying to overbearingly force it into the conversation. Just, <laughs> just to try to make it the bonus movie, but stop trying to, stop trying to rig the I bonus didn't. movies, Colin. You're, <laughs> I didn't, I well, didn't. Just did. I'm telling you, I did you not. Just, you just did. I want the bonus movie to be Sanford and son, because every time they would, ta- they would talk <laughs> about father Lamont. All I could think of was Lamont who plays Fred, it was not the actor. I can't, the actor's Desmond Willis or something, but anyways, the character's name is Lamont. And all I thought was that this would be a significant better movie. If it was Lamont from Sanford and Sons as father Lamont, <laughs> <laughs> you know what it makes me think of? Um, you know what it makes me think of is uh, there was an SNL skit where I think it was Tracy Morgan played James Bond as like a black James Bond. <laughs> and it was, and he was called Lamont Bond. <laughs> oh yeah. Lamont Bond. <laughs> Lamont Bond. Yeah, yeah. That's of what course, me think of. Of course, if the priest was black in this, he probably would have died. So let's oh, let's be happy yeah. we didn't get that. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um. Uh, yeah, I keep thinking back to the pillows in the therapy office, like those kids oh, yeah. in the back pushing that circular pillow. Oh yeah, what the fuck Why? was that thing? <laughs> There was so much going on. Like we could have, we could have done an entire two-hour podcast about the therapy office and all the shit going on in the background. Oh what a bizarre, so many times, bizarre. so many times when we went back there in the movie, I'm just like, where the fuck are we? <laughs> also, do you guys remember the Africa scene where like he's there? He had just climbed up the rock face, I think, and now he's there, and there's a tons of guys like dancing around. The communion, and, shit. and yeah, the communion yeah. scene. But then they bring out like this, like giant golden gram like teddy bear yeah they bake the like, uh the thing the, it's the body of christ that's yeah, the communion. body of christ yeah so they're baking a no but they're baking then, a bread jesus and then eating him oh is that yeah. what it is and they pull pieces yeah. off of that he also uh, really slams that blood of christ like he chugs yeah. the whole cup I was like, down like there's the other the people the here yeah yeah you're like you're supposed to <laughs> yeah you're you're supposed yeah, to take a sip. Uh, he's like, I need it all. I mean, it is Richard Burton, so it's like I think yeah. that's part of his. I think the audiences would have been would have known, like, oh yeah, that's an in joke. He's finishing the wine. <laughs> that's funny. 
You could also tell the cup was empty, and he was. Oh, like, there's no way that cup was empty. He totally. I'm. I'm sure he insisted. <laughs> he was like, "We're doing this with real wine." <laughs> he just chug. Yeah. As as per my as per my writer, it's re- real <laughs> wine and real alcohol in all the scenes. When I'm drinking water, it's actually got to be alcoholic as well. <laughs> it's got to be vodka. Every <laughs> goblet must be filled. Yeah. Well, Mina. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, do you have what are you working on these days? Do you have anything you can plug Ooh, or anything uh, you want? This is going to come yeah, out in a couple I c- weeks, so I don't know if you have something coming up that you can. Um, I don't have anything coming out in a few weeks, but um, the show that I'm writing on, I think, is premiering in 2021 or maybe 2022, COVID permitting. But it's an animated show on Netflix called Gi Happy, and it's the wacky adventures of. Hindu gods as children. So check it out whenever it's on Sounds Netflix. Fun. That's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. What? Who created? Is is it like from the makers of something else? It's or? from the makers of from the guys that brought you. It's from a creator, uh, Sanjay Patel, who um, he was an animator at Pixar for like many years, and then now he's at Netflix. So cool. Yeah, he's the dude. Awesome. Awesome. That's exciting. That sounds good. Yeah. Cool. Um, you, can people follow you somewhere? Are you a Twitter? Uh, yeah, you can follow me at Mina Rules on Twitter. Is, is it rules with a and, Z? And um, oh, no, should it's, it be? it's regular <laughs> rules. Sorry, missed yeah. opportunity <laughs> there. Regrets. Um, yeah. Uh, you can follow me at the Fob and I on Instagram. I it's mostly my personal um gram. Um, so. You can follow me at those two places. Awesome. Yeah. Well, um, uh, we'd love to have you back. I uh, hope you had fun. I'm. De- this was this was uh, joyful. I can honestly say I would never have watched this without you guys. <laughs> well, so. I'm glad we. You're could welcome. This. I'm glad we could inflict <laughs> this on you. <laughs> <laughs> I felt bad because Mina was texting me today. She's like, so this show is like an hour long? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> this is closer to like half a day's worth of dedication. <laughs> yeah, there's no so. easy way to do this. This is fine. I know creative projects are always. Well, the idea of sitting here for and talking to us for two hours must sound exhausting, but I feel like it always goes by a little quicker than I imagine it would. Um, well, I, yeah, I, like that, I like how long you <laughs> hesitated was... before you said yeah. That's good. I'll cut that I was out. drinking a It'll glass of water. I'm drinking reaction. water. But there were there was many twists and turns that we had to get into in the film. So I think that there was no um, shortage of, of that. So yeah. the time. I think if there's quickly. one positive thing we could say about this movie is that it didn't give us a lack of anything to talk about. There's yeah. so yeah. much going on, so much to unpack. Yep. Um, yeah. So in, in conclusion, yeah. great Moonlight movie. Moonlight Graham. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, how can we take ourselves out of this show? Can we? I wish the Arsenio Hall thing yeah. had some sort of audio ooh, 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 element ooh. to it. I guess it does. It has that, like, ooh, 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 ooh. I, I'm sure you can go uh, just like find an old episode on YouTube and just uh, cut it out of there. I mean, don't pirate things <laughs> off YouTube because that's wrong, but you know. Or just rip the sound effect of the uh, hypno thing from the or movie. The hypno toad like from Futurama. Yeah, do it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everyone loves the hypno toad. All right, Arsenio, take us out. Come on.